committee is uh, has a bill before it that uh, relates to a global warming solutions act in Vermont. It's H four sixty two, and um, serendipitously, a couple of weeks ago, I ran into a colleague of yours at the Vermont Law School who said, "Oh, by the way, we ha actually have someone on our faculty now. We've been very involved in this in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and made an introduction uh, of, of me to you." So. Um, uh, I really appreciate you taking time to be here today uh, and um, giving us background on some of the work that you have done in Massachusetts, um, and in, in particular with regard to um, a legal decision uh, that, uh, to some extent, launched the work that has been done in Massachusetts on Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, so um, we record all of our testimony here. So if you could introduce yourself for the record and. Um, uh, and I'd also ask, um, you know, to the extent, I I'm happy for you to go through your entire presentation. If you want to field questions um, during, that's fine too, you know, whatever you're Okay. Um, so take it away. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm Jennifer Rushlow. I'm the Associate Dean for Environmental Programs at Vermont Law School. I've been in that position for about six months. Prior to that, I was at Conservation Law Foundation based in Boston where I was a senior attorney, and I also directed a farm and food program at CLF. And um, I'm planning to talk today about the Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act, and in particular, um, the litigation that flowed from that, where I was lead counsel on the case that ended up being called Kane v. DEP, which is um, what ultimately led the administration in Massachusetts to promulgate regulations stemming from the GWSA statute in Massachusetts. So I have a presentation that talks about the litigation primarily, and I'm happy to go through that, but mostly I want to be helpful to you, and so if you have questions about the statute or, or what's come after the statute implementation, <clears throat> I'm happy to talk about any of that, and I would welcome your questions at any point. Okay? Yeah. So I'll start with the presentation, and we can work from there. I've got this right, it's a PDF. So the Global Warming Solutions Act was passed in 2008, and it, it took its inspiration from California, which had a Global Warming Solutions Act that was passed in, I believe, 2006, called AB 32. That was the first, and Massachusetts, I believe, was the second, and at the time that it was passed in 2008, it was the most stringent uh, climate law of its kind in the country. And what it required was um, for the Secretary of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, which is like A&R here, um, to determine a, a greenhouse gas emissions reduction requirement for 2020 between 20 and 25 percent. The Secretary ultimately decided that it should be 25 percent, and so that's what it is, as well as an 80 percent reduction by 2050. The statute did that. It did a number of other things as well. Um, you can see on this slide several of the provisions that it includes. Most of them have to do with accounting for greenhouse gas emissions from different sources, from different sectors, um, understanding what the baseline for emissions is as a starting point, and then figuring out how to keep track of everybody's emissions so that we can know whether we're getting close to these reduction requirements of you know, 2020, 2050, and the inter interim decades between those. In addition to those inventory requirements, there's also a requirement that the administration issue a plan each decade um, showing how they're going to get to the emissions limit requirement for that decade. So for instance, um, the administration issued a plan in 2010 that was then updated in 2015 to show how they were going to get to the 2020 reduction of 25% as required by the statute. So it sounds like twice a decade. That's what they've done. I don't think, I don't think the statute is um, specific yeah. in how frequently those plans come out, just that, just that they have to come out to show how you're going to get to that requirement each decade. Yeah. Um, they are required to do that um, periodically it, throughout. And the requirement that was um, most relevant to the litigation that I was a part of is 
Section 3D of the statute, which I'll refer to as Section 3D, which required the Department of Environmental Protection, which is uh, within the auspices of the umbrella agency that I mentioned earlier, to promulgate regulations enforcing the statute. And so it was that section and that requirement that was at the heart of the litigation and is primarily what I'll plan to talk about. So this is the language of Section 3D. And um, I, you know, I've read the bill that's before you, and I see that you have some version of this. Um, this is what we have in Massachusetts, and it's important to really understand each of these words because that was ultimately what um, CLF sued the state over was you know the meaning of these words and what it required the agency to do. So DEP. So language is uh, the department, meaning DEP, shall promulgate regulations establishing a desired level of declining annual aggregate emission limits for sources or categories of sources that emit greenhouse gas emissions. And I think the part of that that ended up having the most discussion was establishing a desired level first and declining annual aggregate emissions limits second. Those are kind of the two pieces that I think there was the most uh, discussion about. Yeah, is there a question? Yes, yeah, we go along. Yeah, yeah please. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so this, this is entirely about emissions rather, uh, well, I guess <laughs> slicing and dicing. Yeah. Um, so it's about emissions, which is a, different from how those emissions are treated, like sequestration. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Was it's, there discussion at this point on? on so that? the way that the statute is written is is to give the agency broad discretion and flexibility in the method through which emissions reductions happen. What the statute did was just say. The reductions have to happen. Mm -hmm. We're telling the agency that they're in charge of making sure that they happen, but the methods that they use, like you mentioned sequestration, or the particular sources or the categories of sources like the transportation sector or the electricity sector, that's up to the agency to determine. And they were intentionally very broad in allowing the agency that flexibility. So when all this was going on, you, you refer to the agency, was there any public hearings or, or business input or anything on, on this as well? Rulemaking, I'm assuming, is what this was? Right, so um, was DP, DP did not conduct a rulemaking, which is what the litigation was about. The fact that they, they, didn't, they didn't issue the regulations required by this section on their own. So the litigation was to prompt them to issue those regulations. When they ultimately did, which was after the conclusion of the litigation, there were public hearings and all, all kinds of stakeholders and people who had an interest in it participated in that. Uh, <clears throat> could an identified source be a negative source, as in the case of carbon sequestration? Um, a source <coughs> is anybody that um, yeah. emits greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so so the, I think the, the method of reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, is something that would be included in the, in the regulations and is addressed in the ultimate regulations, but the source is something that, that is responsible for emitting greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm, I'm hung up on the word, word desired. <laughs> um, desired by whom? <coughs> on what basis? Mm -hmm. and, that was ultimately a part of the discussion in the litigation. Okay. Yeah. And you're going to talk more about that. I can do that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, just spending a little bit of time before we get to that, if it's helpful, on um, what happened before the litigation was filed. So, as I mentioned, um, the secretary of EEA, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, was responsible for issuing a plan for how they were going to get to 25% reductions by 2020. They issued that plan in 2010, they updated it in 2015. For those of us that were following what the state was planning to do to get to the required emissions reductions, 
this was uh, the best information that was out there for seeing what the state intended to do, what its plans were. There was no mention in this plan of regulations that they had passed or that they planned to pass that um, flowed from this requirement right here. So there were discussions of programmatic changes, there were discussions of uh, regional partnerships, there were even discussions of existing regulations, but there was no talk of promulgating regulations to satisfy this requirement specifically. And so that's what we were looking for is, does the state have a plan, specifically the agency, have a plan to ratchet down emissions and to put that in regulations so that it's enforceable? And had the, had, the, um, had the goals actually been defined at that point? In yes. 2015? Okay. Yes. So they were there? Yes. But no strategy to, to meet them? No regulatory strategy pursuant to this section. So, yes. So at that point, um, a number of advocacy strategies were being used to try and Tell, the, tell DEP that they needed to promulgate regulations pursuant to this section. And there were a few different things that happened to um, try and move that forward. There was a petition in November 2012 submitted by hundreds of youth to DEP. There was a petition for rulemaking <coughs> saying you need to promulgate regulations pursuant to this section of 3D. I'll just leave that up for a minute. Um, and in response to that, DEP said, we don't agree with that interpretation that we're required to promulgate regulations in the way that you say that we are. Um, but even if we were, we've actually promulgated several sets of regulations that we believe comply with this requirement. And so that, that was their response. And that response continued to be true through ultimately the litigation. Um, I can tell you what those three sets of regulations were that they relied on at the time. Um, I'll just go to a further slide here. So these are the three sets of regulations that DEP relied on. Um, the low emission vehicle regulations are regulations that come from the Clean Air Act, which allows states to either follow federal requirements or California's requirements for reducing emissions from car fleets. Um, so the, the key thing to know about these regulations is that they were adopted in, let's see, they were ultimately adopted for the first time in 1990. They were updated in 2012. Um, and we ultimately had um, quite a bit of debate over whether they satisfied Section 3D. Um, and, and we, advocates and ultimately plaintiffs in the litigation, felt that it didn't, but DEP argued that it did. Um, and I can get into more detail on that if it's helpful. Um, another set of regulations they relied on are the sulfur hexafluoride regulations. Um, Sulfur hexafluoride is a gas that's used to insulate switchgear equipment. Um, basically what that means is on power lines, if you want to de-energize a power line so that a maintenance crew can go in and work on it, um, that can be a pretty dangerous thing. So you insulate that equipment with this gas, sulfur hexafluoride, it makes it safer. Um, it's responsible for a very, very, very small percentage of greenhouse gas emissions in the state. It is a powerful greenhouse gas emission. It's more potent than methane even, but it's very small. Um, so they relied on that. And then they also relied on REGI, the, green, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And um, that's a, a regional compact between states. And um, you know the argument from us was that that doesn't guarantee emissions reductions in any one particular state. It guarantees emissions reduction regionally. Um, a DEP relied on that. So those, that was the response that they gave to the youth when, when they filed that um, petition for rulemaking. In addition to that youth strategy, which was a, a pretty formal strategy in that they submitted something formally to the agency, there were also more informal conversations happening between Conservation Law Foundation and other advocates and the state saying, you know, this is how we interpret Section 3D, what's your plan? 
Um, and the response to that was was similar to what was said to the youth, which is we don't interpret it that way, and um, we've got these other regulations that we're relying on. And so CLF had those conversations in a way that was sort of increasingly <coughs> concerning to the organization. And um, after you know starting with a pretty gentle approach of, of talking to the agency and um, trying to find common ground, um, that then led to a notice of intent to the agency stating an intent to sue. And there was a good amount of time after that allowing some time to see if the agency would then respond to that and take action. And, and that didn't happen. And so ultimately, a lawsuit was filed. But I think it's important to know that that was years after the Section 3D regulations were required to be promulgated. And I can talk a little bit about that timeline. And so it didn't happen instantaneously. It was after many other strategies were tried. Um, so before we get into the litigation, mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested in the lead up. Uh, sure. that, that got you there. <clears throat> was it clear prior to the the, um, the Kane litigation beginning that um, that the state was actually not meeting the goals? Was there measurement that was um, being undertaken by the state by DEP to to attempt to demonstrate that um, that the goals were being met, or that that uh, at least Massachusetts was on track to to meet the goals? There was some information available to the public um, that, that, that the administration thought they were on track to achieve those goals. I think there was some skepticism um, from others outside of the administration about whether the strategies that the state had in place would actually get to that goal. So I think there may have been some differences of opinion about that. There was no formal program to measure and document progress that had or hadn't been made. There are formal, there are formal, so when I mentioned uh, the statute and the um, accounting provisions, that does exist. I mean, the important thing to know is that, I think some of the context here is, is that this was the first piece of implementation of this statute. So it was still kind of getting established how everything was gonna work. There were a number of market factors, such as coal plants closing and um, the proliferation of natural gas that were kind of naturally leading to some emissions reductions. And so I think there was some thinking on behalf of some advocates that um, with time, those economic factors alone weren't going to be enough to get to eventually 80% reductions by 2050. And so when I say there is some skepticism about whether the plans and strategies that the that the state had in place would ultimately get us where we needed to go over the long term. That's why simply relying on the data um, still left some room for concern about whether, you know, this was a long term strategy and a marathon, not a sprint, and whether we were actually going to get where we needed to go over the long term. If that makes sense. It does. And what I guess what I'm trying to what I'm trying to understand, just kind of rewinding to whatever the year was, 2013, sure. 2014, is um, I, I think I understand what's in 3D and what wasn't happening mm -hmm. uh, in Massachusetts. Um, what I'm also trying to understand is uh, the argument that A, Massachusetts doesn't have a strategy that is coherent and says, here is what we're doing uh, as a commonwealth to address this issue. <laughs> In contrast to, we got a bunch of things going on, and hey, this you know it happens to be that you know we're making some progress based on what's going on in the market. It's different than a strategy and uh, you know a policy initiative to, right. to get there. That's one thing. But then the other is actually making the case, which I think we can do on, making the case that we've set these targets. And we see that either we're not meeting them or we're not on track to meet them. Mm -hmm. And kind of pointing to those two things as issues right. and as reasons why we need to step up. Right. We need a strategy. Um, and one of the reasons we need a strategy is we're not meeting the targets that we've met. Right. And I'm wondering, you know, to the extent both of the, and I, I understand the second part. It doesn't sound like there was a, a strategy that the Commonwealth had to right. actually move forward on this. Okay. I'm less clear on I think I measurement. 
So I think that yeah, this um, has a happy ending, so I know how it ends. But yeah, I, I it, you know, right. as, uh, rewinding to 2014. Right. <coughs> I think that um, it it sounds like it may be the case that where Vermont is right now and where Massachusetts was in that moment are not exactly the same. Yeah. Um, I think that in, are not. In, did you say are not? Are we're not, we're not um, and perhaps are not. Um, I think that. Massachusetts may have had more more data on its side saying we're getting where we need to go why isn't that enough ultimately that wasn't what the litigation was about it sounds like in Vermont you have even more of a reason to be concerned because you're not getting where you need to go and I think had that been the case in Massachusetts that would have been an additional factor mm -hmm. but as it was that wasn't that wasn't really the focus of the dispute um, in Massachusetts, was there any uh, real attempt to resolve the problem by amending or diluting Section 3D? Or was, um, or was there general agreement on, yes, these goals are valid, it's a question of how and when we move there? Do you mean during the process of getting the law passed or after the fact? After the fact. After yeah. the fact. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any formal attempts to dilute the language of Section 3D. I think at the point that the litigation was going on, um, it was still sort of, people were sort of in a wait and see mode to see, you know, are these advocates gonna be successful in making the case that this is what this means? And so it wasn't until after, you know, the highest court in the state said, yes, this is what it means, that people started to look at it that way within the administration. Um, I think the legislature knew what it meant because they passed the law with that language. Um, but since then, <coughs> there have not been attempts to water that down, to my knowledge. <coughs> okay. okay. Should I continue talking about yeah, that? Yeah, thank you. So after those, those softer strategies of working with the agency and um, seeing if they could be brought around to promulgate these regulations, and that ultimately didn't happen. And I do want to just mention the, the timeline of this. Um, as I mentioned, the statute was passed in 2008. The, the agency, DEP, was required to promulgate regulations to comply with Section 3D by January 1st, 2012. And the regulations were required to take effect a year later on January 1st, 2013. And there's a sunset provision, and I've noticed that this is addressed a little differently in the Vermont bill. There's a sunset provision in the Massachusetts GWSA um, that these regulations, the 3D regulations, expire at the end of, 20, the end of 2020, December 31st, 2020. So uh, when the complaint was filed, um, and that happened, let's see, The complaint was filed in 2014. Um, at that point, it had been six years since the law was passed and two years since the agency was required to have completed the process of promulgating these regulations. Um, and so I think that timing is, is critical to understand. And at that point, there were only six years left for the regulations before they were set to sunset according to the provisions of the statute. So things were getting pretty urgent. Um, at that point. The plaintiffs in the litigation were four teenagers who were part of the youth petition for rulemaking to DEP, as well as Conservation Law Foundation on behalf of its members, and the nonprofit Mass Energy Consumers Alliance, which represents um, low-income and middle-income consumers uh, with an interest in being able to secure clean energy. Can I, can I ask why you refer to them as four teenagers? Are they 18 and older, or are they under the age of They were in age? high school at so, the time of the litigation. So under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And why is that relevant in the sense of the overall process for, um, I mean, could it have been grade school kids? It could have. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to give you a sense of who they were. Yeah, sure. Just for descriptive purposes. I think 
it in the greater context of why this litigation is significant and um, it is noteworthy that, that youth are involved in lawsuits and in advocacy on this issue and I think that's a national trend. I don't think I know that's a national trend. And, um, this is one of those instances where youth are very concerned about what their states are doing about greenhouse gas emissions. And so, um, The defendant in this lawsuit was the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, and um, CLF and the other plaintiffs didn't name anyone individually, didn't name the governor. Um, really, this was a very targeted lawsuit about one particular re requirement, one responsibility of this agency. And so it wasn't styled in kind of a flashy way. It was really very targeted and really trying to rely on the law and um, get to a particular result. And the two claims that were part of this lawsuit were a declaratory judgment and a writ for mandamus, which are two different ways of getting the court to say DEP has to issue these regulations. So that was what the plaintiffs sought. Can, can, I missed law school. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can you tell me what those two claims are? Mm -hmm. what, what does that actually mean? That's so a declaratory label. judgment is when um, you ask the judge to say this is what the law means, mm -hmm. to declare this is what the law means and this is what it, it requires. A writ of mandamus is when a member of the public asks a court to compel an agency to do something or to compel the government to do something. Okay. So that's what I mean when I say it's sort of two different ways of getting at the same thing, but the, there's some slight differences in the legal meaning. Thank you. So the, the arguments around whether the agency was required to promulgate these regulations really fell into two categories. One is, what does Section 3D mean and what does it require the agency to do, if anything? And then the second is, well, regardless of what Section 3D means, DEP promulgated these three regulations, is that enough? So that was, it really fell into those two buckets. So focusing on the first one, which is the statutory interpretation, which is, okay, we've got this language of 3D, which is at the top of this slide, what does it mean? What the plaintiffs said, um, you see at the bottom of the slide, which is, you know, they made the argument that the language of this statute is very plain, it's very clear, um, and that it means that the regulations have to address multiple sources of emissions impose a limit on those emissions that can be released from those sources, limit the aggregate emissions that can be released, so the total emissions from that, those sets of sources, and set emissions limits for each year that decline. <coughs> so in other words, the total emissions from these sources have to ratchet down year by year. The regulations have to accomplish that. What DEP said is that this phrase, desired level, means that DEP was only required to establish aspirational goals or unenforceable targets. And that, that's the language that, that they used in their briefs. Um, and so they felt like the word desired essentially modified limit so that a limit in fact meant a goal in this case. So desired limit equals goal. In, according to DEP's interpretation. If, if I can again. Um, so you mentioned that you felt that the legislature felt that it wasn't achieving what it was intended to achieve, correct? The agency, the, the, the agency uh, wasn't achieving what it right. intended to, so it was to do. So why not let the legislature deal with this? Why, why did Conservation Law Foundation and others have to jump in and litigate? Well, it had been six years since the statute was passed and two years since the agency was required to do this and the legislature hadn't taken action. So, so again, you feel that the CLF and others that litigated or, or presented the litigation were more informed and represented the people of Massachusetts more than the legislature? That's not what I said. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's my interpretation of what happened. Well, um, I think that... Because to me, this could not only be just for this bill, but for any bill out there that I see. 
whether it's gun regulations or whatever. I mean, that's what the legislature's responsibility is. And I mean, last year in agriculture, we dealt with a citizen's right to sue regarding, um, you know, uh, nutrient management plants, mm -hmm. which thank goodness, you know, we didn't, we didn't go down that road because, you know, things like this are always changing. It's the same as the nutrient management plan in my mind, that you can't go in with these specific purposes when industry's changing, technology's changing, whatever it is, and I, and I think, you know, I just, I, I just am upset with the process that's going on uh, in states with Conservation Law Foundation and others that's, that's going to make it difficult for citizens to, to uh, live and work in their states. So to respond to that, um, I'm, I'm no longer at Conservation Law Foundation. I'm here today as a law professor and, and a dean at Vermont Law School. And, uh, you know, from, from that perspective as a law professor, I would say that there's, the responsibility of the legislature is to pass a law that is written in such a way that the rest of the world can interpret it and expect that the language of that law will be carried out. And the nature of the law is also such that that creates the ability for a number of avenues for, for litigation if that law is not met. And so that's, that's the nature of the law, that, that that remedy is out there. Well, and that's what attorneys are for, to interpret, to interpret the law one way or the other. That's that is what attorneys are for. And that's why we go to court. That's right. <clears throat> I'll also uh, mention in that regard that uh, depending on the wording, you can have different interpretations of the same law. And therefore, if there's a disagreement, then you have to have some way of determining that, you know, which which interpretation is correct. And that's where the uh, litigation comes in. <coughs> and the legislature may feel that, that it's obvious enough, but um, if somebody interprets it differently, then require litigation. So are there any other questions about the statutory interpretation before I talk about the regulations? Just looking back at 3D, um, mm -hmm. and again, this is 2020 hindsight, um, we get pretty caught up on the word <coughs> shall in this building. And Fair enough. it's, you know, shall is pretty clear. Um, and uh, this was not a straightforward uh, lawsuit. Um, it, 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 my, my sense is it took some um, uh, it took some turns. Um, it wasn't clear what the outcome of this lawsuit was going to be at the end of the day. Um, but the, the word "shall" in Section 3D is pretty clear to me. Um, so, where was that? Uh, if, if you can um, put on the hat of the attorneys that represented uh, DEP here, um, what was the case that they were making mm -hmm. that uh, makes it unclear that maybe the department may, as opposed to shall, promulgate regulation? I think that, um, so it was the Attorney General's office representing DEP, and I think the position of the Attorney General was that not that, not to write out shall promulgate regulations, not to argue that shall means may, um, as you said, but rather that the regulations could simply include aspirational goals as opposed to the limits that <clears throat> the plaintiffs. The regulations are desired. The regulations establish desired goals, is what DUP would say. I see. So they, I think they still agreed that they were required to do some kind of regulations. It's what those regulations did, how they were written, that the disagreement was about. Okay. But I, I, I'm curious, I'm sorry, no, no, no. Um, um, I'm curious about the background of the word desired. Is there, it, it, there must be some, um, Legislative some something history. that, yeah, some, some history there about, about the intent of that word mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the basis for determining what, what desired is. Can, can you talk about that? I can, that? sure. So we all, you know, everyone who was part of the litigation looked back at the legislative history, dug into the floor debates and the, and the prior versions of the bills, 
and there was no discussion among members of the legislature about what desired means. Um, there were earlier versions of the bill, um, but they were not terribly illuminating as to what that, mer what that word meant. And so that is a great example of how lawyers, <laughs> lawyers had to come in and sort of, you know, haggle it out. Um, was there debate on what constitutes a greenhouse gas? That was very clearly established in the statute, and so I, I don't know. That wasn't part of the litigation. I think everyone felt like that was clear. With the benefit of hindsight, um, is there an alternate um, wording or phraseology that you would have recommended Massachusetts use in that, in, instead of that D section that would have been far more precise and would have bypassed this whole process? Great question. Um, I'm sure there is. <laughs> <laughs> I think the phrase that is the most uh, confusing is desired level. Um, I think you could take that out and it would be a lot clearer to most people reading this language. Um, that being said, I, I fully appreciate the, the lawmaking process is long and arduous. And, they did their best, and this represented a compromise, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, just thinking out those words, a desired level of. Right. Make it much bigger. Fair point. So I mentioned these three regulations. Um, this is where it gets fairly technical, and you can let me know how, how much of that you'd like to hear. Um, yes, you'd like to hear it? Okay. <laughs> well, to, um, I'll kind of jump right into the heart of it. The top two regulations um, did something that the plaintiffs were concerned about, which is rather than limiting the total or aggregate, is the word in Section 3D, emissions from a group of sources, so in the LEV, the Low Emission Vehicle Regulations, that was cars sold in Massachusetts, fleets of cars sold by their <coughs> manufacturers. In the sulfur hexafluoride regulations, it was the total emitted um, sulfur hexafluoride from this switchgear equipment, as I mentioned. The regulations didn't limit those aggregate emissions for those groups of sources. What they did is establish an acceptable rate of emissions. <clears throat> The difference being that with a rate, if the total capacity from those sources increased, meaning if you had more switchgear equipment, if you had more cars, the aggregate emissions from those sources goes up. If you limit aggregate emissions, that's the limit. And everybody who's within that space has to figure out how to comply with it. Have a question? So I have a question with regard to nuclear. Okay. And that limiting. And so in Vermont, we had a nuclear power plant that mm -hmm. went offline, which likely contributed to a slowing down at least of our trajectory on emissions. In Mass, you have a nuclear power plant that is going offline this summer. How will that, I shouldn't say you're, you're here in Vermont, so in Mass they have a nuclear power plant that is going offline. Do we have expected impact um, here with regard to the aggregate emission levels and um, what, that's, what, what they're going to be dealing with? I can't speak to how the state of Massachusetts is um, factoring in okay. that into their, their total emissions projections. These three sets of regulations did not get to that, get to that sector. So that rate issue was something that, that the courts wrestled with. There were two different courts that, that looked at this issue. Ultimately, um, you know, this, the Supreme Court agreed that regulations that, that were written to satisfy Section 3D had to limit the aggregate emissions for the sources that they regulate. And ratcheting down a rate does not accomplish that. Because if you add more cars, if you add more capacity, the aggregate emissions go up. 
I'm seeing nodding, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay. And then um, the regional greenhouse gas regulations, the, the REGI initiative, um, as I mentioned earlier, that's a regional initiative, and the regulations that each state has to accomplish that require that at the regional level emissions go down, but the nature of the program is such that regulated entities trade credits, and for instance, the Massachusetts <coughs> regulated entities' power plants over a certain size could buy credits from some other state, and it's conceivable that the emissions reductions could happen in all of the other states and not Massachusetts. Is that likely? Perhaps not, but it's a possibility. And, and the question here was, were these regulations written in such a way that they guaranteed aggregate emissions reductions for those sources? So that was, um, those were the three regulations that were put forward and that was the argument against whether they complied with this section 3D. I think the plaintiffs were very careful to make clear that they were not saying these were bad regulations, they were not saying they weren't great programs, but did they comply with section 3D, that very narrow question, they did not. So just to summarize this timeline here, um, the regulations were required to be promulgated, well, they were required to be issued in 2012, promulgated and um, put into effect by 2013. Complaint was filed in 2014. Um, the complaint was filed in Superior Court, which is the trial court level in Massachusetts, um, and the plaintiffs lost. DEP was successful at the Superior Court level. And what the court, what the judge said at the Superior Court was, we hear that you have two different interpretations of what Section 3D means. We're finding that regardless of what it means, the, the three regulations put forward by DEP satisfy it. Whether it means what the plaintiffs say, whether it means what the defendants say it means, <laughs> the regulations satisfy it either way. So that's it. Um, the plaintiffs appealed that decision that appeal would naturally go to the, um, the appellate court in Massachusetts, the Court of Appeals, which is the intermediate level. There is a provision that allows appellants to seek direct review by the highest court, the Supreme Judicial Court, or the SJC. So the plaintiffs applied for that, and the SJC granted that direct review. And um, that direct review is something that's reserved only for extraordinary cases, and um, so the SJC took this up thinking that it was a critical case of some kind. You know, it doesn't mean that they're going to rule one way or the other, but they felt it was something that they needed to take up in a timely matter and that they wanted to weigh in on. And so um, they took it up. A decision was issued in May 17th, 2016. So now we're, we've got four years left before these regulations sunset. Was the sunset um, a key factor in them deciding, in the SJC deciding to take Probably. Yeah. I can't okay. speak to what okay. went through their minds, but they if I were to try and guess. They didn't say that. Okay. No, there's no, um, they don't tell you why okay. they've taken it up. You just get to guess. <laughs> yeah. So this is some key language from the decision that ultimately came from the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts. Um, and um, Kane BDP is the name of the decision that ultimately came out. Kane, Isabel Kane was one of the youth plaintiffs in the case. Um, and the court said, the unambiguous language of Section 3D requires the department to promulgate regulations that establish volumetric limits on multiple greenhouse gas emission sources expressed in carbon dioxide equivalents and that such limits must decline on an annual basis. So that was what they said about the statutory language. Then on the regulations itself, they said, we further conclude that the sulfur hexafluoride regi and low emission vehicle regulations fall short of complying with Section 3D because they fail to ensure the type of mass-based reductions in greenhouse gases across the sources or categories of sources regulated under each program as intended by the legislature. And so they reversed the Superior Court. Yeah. So the I just want to make sure I'm clear, the limits <clears throat> uh, 
the statutory limits must decline, not what's the result. The regulatory, the regulations must include declining annual limits. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there an overall cost that this costs and the plaintiffs as well as the state? Do we know that? Don't know that. Mm -hmm. And I've got a question about kind of the first half of this. Um, not being familiar with the law, and maybe it's beyond Section 3D. Maybe there's a, um, but to, to, to what extent, and I'm looking at uh, the fourth line of this, um, and I'm just picking out a very specific thing that the court ruled, um, and that such limits must decline on an annual basis. Was that something that was in the law, or was that something that the court um, interpreted? Yeah, no, that was in 3D. So 3D includes um, that the regulations establish a desired level of declining <coughs> annual aggregate emissions okay. limits. So it is in the law. Yeah. So, so in effect, the court, the SJC is saying that the desired limit that, that the uh, DEP is responsible for, for saying what desired limits are by establishing volumetric limits, or desired levels are by establishing volumetric limits. So they're saying that the, the desired must be defined by the DDP yes. in volumetric limits. Yes. So you do get there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it finds meaning. Yeah. So the plaintiffs won. That, that was the finding of the Supreme Judicial Court. Following um, that decision, a couple interesting things happened. Um, the governor, Governor Baker, the current governor, issued an executive order, which is number 569, establishing an integrated climate change strategy for the Commonwealth. And that executive order does a number of things. Um, one of the whereas clauses in the executive order is that the Supreme Judicial Court ruled that the steps mandated by the GWSA include promulgation of regulations by the Department of Environmental Protection and that quotes the language that you just saw from the Kane decision. And, um, and then section two of that executive order basically restates um, what's in the SJC decision, that DP shall promulgate regulations, and it sets out a timeline that the governor is saying DP needs to follow up on this SJC decision, and this is what you need to do and by when. And so it required them to um, promulgate regulations by August 11th, 2017, um, and and it did a couple other things um, indicating how they wanted DP to go about this, but yes. Um, so it seems to me that, that they're not required, the DP's not required to regulate all greenhouse gas emissions, but certain categories or aggregate categories to reach whatever these de desired levels are. Is, is that correct? That's correct. The legislature wanted, apparently, to give DEP that discretion to determine which sources they wanted to regulate and how much greenhouse gas emissions reductions would be accomplished from those sources. Like I see passenger vehicles, I don't see commercial vehicles. Right. <coughs> so this is um, not a comprehensive... I see energy generation, I don't see processing fuels. Right. So these are the six regulations that they came up with after, in order to comply with the SJC's decision. There was, um, if, you go, if you're interested in understanding the process, there are um, documents online at DEP, such as this document is a background document that was issued when all the regulations were being considered. Um, and there were public hearings and, and commenting procedures for each of these separate regulations. Um, they ended up deciding to amend the sulfur hexafluoride regulations in such a way that they accomplished what the SJC said they would need to. Um, they ended up going a different direction for passenger vehicles, um, but the, as you can see, there are a couple of regulations here which target the transportation sector, um, a couple that target the power sector, and um, 
that's what they target. <laughs> yes. And in aggregate, the DEP um, in putting forth these regulations has uh, said that these will meet the statutory goals of the Global Warming Solutions Act in Massachusetts. And future measurement will determine whether or not they've actually accomplished that. So these regulations alone are not um, intended by themselves to get to 25% reductions by 2020 or 80% by 2050. They're part of a suite of um, programs and uh, strategies that the state is using to get to that overall reduction requirement. So this is one piece of that puzzle. And that's what the plan that accompanies each limit each decade, that's what that plan lays out is everything they're going to do. And the next plan would include these regulations as well as everything else that they hope to do, like building more solar arrays and um, you know, other sorts of voluntary measures. Is there a time horizon associated with each of these so that they would review the actual effects of the regulations in, in terms of uh, uh, their contribution to the aggregate limit? Um, so that, I'm not aware that there is. You know, so, so that they would come back and revisit and, and as I say, tweak or, or adjust the, the particular regu regulations or limits in each regulation in order to meet that aggregate limit. Well, since Section 3D required promulgations that, or sorry, required the promulgation of regulations that, that sunset in 2020. Um, yeah, what does that mean? Yeah, that's something I wanted to go to as yeah. well. Why the sunset provision was put in the initial um, law and... I would love to know. Okay. But, <laughs> but, but did, did, did the sunset... Yeah, it's all over that. Yeah. Well, did, did the sunset mean that after um, 2020, regulations would not have to be promulgated? Okay. I guess so. Okay. That's somebody's vote. Huh. Okay. Years my, uh, my law professor self says um, it's a strange provision, and I... It doesn't seem as though it would be consistent with accomplishing the goals of the rest of the statute. I would not say that provision was, was well written. So, uh, I don't know if you're prepared to do this, and I don't want to catch you off guard. Um, and we, we can you know, maybe talk about this at a future date if you're not um, ready to discuss this. As I mentioned at the beginning of our hearing, we have a bill before us, H-462, which um, I think attempts to do some of the things that the original Massachusetts statute did, but uh, maybe take some corrective action so that we don't wind up in litigation or that it's clearer. And, um, I'm wondering if you're prepared to maybe discuss some of what's in H-462, um, or I would also say we'd be interested in your feedback on that if not today. I think that um, I would prefer to talk about it at another time okay. at more length, but I will say from an initial read, I think you've, you've done a nice job of trying to correct some of the challenges of the Massachusetts GWSA, and I would be happy to weigh in in more detail at a later date. Yeah. I mean, I, I, so not being an attorney, um, but being someone who's very interested in what this bill is trying to accomplish, uh, what, what Massachusetts was trying to accomplish, I actually share some of Mark's concerns in that the goal here is not to wind up in litigation. The goal is to um, pass a law that puts us on a track to address these issues and not wind in and um, in that context have the legislature be crystal clear um, the end that we're trying to get to. And uh, the legislature may debate that and may determine that, um, you know, we disagree uh, in our legislative body on what those things are. But my goal would be that we are very clear on what we're trying to accomplish and setting out a path for, uh, for the executive branch. We have a citizen legislature in Vermont that's in session for four months a year that, you know, is very limited in terms of its staff capacity. 
we have a, an executive branch that's um, quite powerful uh, in relative terms to the, to the legislative branch, um, and that the legislative branch would be asking, uh, actually uh, mandating, that our executive branch put in place a strategy with um, you know, very specific gates um, to get through to, to meet certain targets, which I think are imperative. And um, again, the idea, in my mind, is that we're trying to be as clear as possible <coughs> so that we, we don't want to wind up where Massachusetts did in, in 2013, 2014. Uh, Litigation is not a foregone conclusion. A strong lawmaking process with stakeholder input would certainly be a good step toward avoiding that. Sounds like mm -hmm. but your last sentence is worse to live by, I think. Depends who's got the most money. <laughs> so, so one of my, uh, I, I think a concern that the legislature has a, about moving forward is that this bill is not, what Massachusetts did is not proscriptive. Well, it doesn't, the, legislat the legislation doesn't, mm -hmm say how to achieve the goals that's right. left to the discretion of the administration and um, and other entities right <laughs> the, that this just says we need to set these goals and move toward them and takes one step further and says and we're going to require the agency to to enforce to enforce <laughs> to make sure that we get there by promulgating regulations that accomplish X. So that is one step further than just saying we got to get there. Right. But it doesn't tell the agency which sources to regulate or exactly how much. <coughs> but it mandates the style of regulation. Or how to regulate. Just the style, just the right. design of the regulations. Yeah, I think we do say how much, and maybe I'm not correct in that, but we do have these goals. And I guess what I'm looking at that as the kind of uh, quantitative aspect of what we're doing. I agree. Um, but we don't, we're not prescriptive in terms of how do we get to those goals. That's left to, um, to the executive branch. Are you referring to the Massachusetts law or the proposed Vermont law? Actually, both. Um, I, I well, that existing law. Yeah, that, and the existing, existing Vermont law is aspirational. Right. But, but those but aspirations quantitative. are quantitative. quantitative yes. Right, so the legislation establishes those reduction requirements, and that is a mandate, but without a foothold on how to get there, it's sort of left to chance. And so that is something that, you know, what Massachusetts did in, in reference to that question is, um, instead of the legislature defining the exact pathway for how to get there, um, they allowed the DEP which has more information, you know, as a, an agency with expertise about which sources emit how much, about the um, market me mechanisms at play for each sector, about the available technologies. And so in that way, the legislature was deferring to the expertise of the agency in saying, you're already very well educated about how best to implement this, and we defer to you on how exactly to go about that and to engage with the public in doing that, but you're the enforcer and we're gonna make sure that you do that. That's, that's essentially what the legislature was saying to DEP. Um, so you've mentioned California and Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Are there other states that have done this? Yes, there are other states that have Global Warming Solutions Act laws now. Um, I can't tell you whether they have provisions like Section 3G. I'm not. I, I don't have that information today. Do you know roughly how many states? Oh, I. I want to say six or more. Um, if that is information that would be valuable to the committee, that's certainly something that BLS could provide. An analysis of those other laws. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so one thing I noticed is that there's there's nothing there about. Uh, emissions from heating sources, residential mm -hmm. heating. Right. And um, you know, in Vermont, uh, that makes up about 24% of the 
greenhouse gas emissions. And it was there a reason why, uh, I'll ask the question, you may not know the answer. Is there a reason why that wasn't included in, in the regulations? I can't speak to that. Um, okay. I will say that uh, some of my former colleagues at CLF in Massachusetts were more involved in this rulemaking process after the litigation than I was. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps it would be useful just to, to hear from them. Okay. But I can't speak to that. I'm going to jump in here with um, kind of a uh, granular uh, question that relates to how Massachusetts um, was or wasn't allowed to, um, DP was not allowed to point to um, Reggie as a strategy or as a, um, uh, as a regulatory path that they were taking to achieve the, these goals. Um, Vermont's obviously involved in Reggie. Uh, I'm hopeful that we're going to be involved in uh, the Transportation Climate Initiative. Those are strategies um, that, you know, could ultimately affect, well, certainly Reggie is, but um, TCI, I hope even more so, um, affect the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont. <coughs> How, um, under this lawsuit and, and um, kind of where the law stands in Massachusetts right now, can the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or potentially the state of Vermont in the future kind of reach toward or point to this is part of our strategy for mm -hmm. meeting um, our greenhouse gas emissions yes. statutory goals. Yes. So a couple of thoughts. Mm -hmm. One, um, the secretary in the plan that I mentioned that was um, amended in 2015 to show how the state would get to the 2020 um, emissions limit requirements did refer to Reggie as a strategy for accomplishing those emissions reductions. And that's a valid, that's a valid claim. Whether Reggie could comply with Section 3D specifically is another question. So can the administration say that they're relying on Reggie to help get to those emissions reductions? Sure. Can the administration say that Reggie complies with Section 3D and, and specifically is one of the regulations that accomplishes DEP's requirements under Section 3D? They couldn't, and that's what the court found. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you want to follow up on that? I didn't mean to interrupt. Sure. So, just to, to, to continue answering your question, um, is it possible that a state like Vermont <coughs> participating in Reggie and TCI could, in some fashion, rely on those. I mean, um, any regulatory strategy coming out of the TCI initiative is yet, it's yet to be seen what that would look like. And so that's, a, that's an open question. But for Reggie, um, my understanding is that there are some requirements as a participant in Reggie as to what um, a state's regulations look like in order to comply with Reggie. Could Massachusetts or Vermont um, legislate beyond the, the original requirements of Reggie to say, in addition to these regional emissions reductions, Massachusetts or Vermont's own emissions reductions must be X. Certainly, you could do that for the same regulated entities, but it would be going above and beyond what the regional program provides. And I assume the same would be true on the transportation side, but again, we don't know what those regulations would look like. So just to play this back to you to make sure I understand. Um, in terms of the statutory goals that Massachusetts has, um, Reggie may be pointed to as something that contributes to meeting those goals, but it does not f fulfill DEP's obligation to promulgate policy and regulation that contributes to those goals. Right. So this, okay. the, as the court determined, regulations that satisfy the Section 3D requirement have to be of a certain kind, yeah. and they have to guarantee aggregate emissions reductions and in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And Reggie doesn't guarantee that. Mm -hmm. Can it hopefully contribute mm -hmm. to where we end up? Certainly. But it's not a Section 3D regulation because of how it's written. And this is going to get even a little deeper into the weeds. Um, my very superficial understanding of what's going on in Massachusetts um, is that uh, with Actually, I won't even get into that now. It's too far to for this discussion. So, we have to, we, Mass had to have their own regulation to point to Reggie. Could their own regulation 
simply mimic the objective of Reggie? Or do they have to go above and beyond that? It would have to guarantee emissions. It would have to limit aggregate emissions from power plants over 25 megawatts, as, which is what Reggie applies to, we have to limit those emissions and ratchet them down year by year in Massachusetts. Reggie doesn't do that. So it could cover the same sector. It could, um, it could regulate power plants in a similar fashion. But the emissions limits in Reggie are regional and not state specific. Turning around in my head a little bit, what is incentivized here? Because with emissions reduction, it would seem that to have a greater effect, we would want to connect more efforts. Mm -hmm. And this seems like we are incentivizing disconnection of efforts. Well, the regulations to satisfy Section 3D don't have to regulate the same sources as Reggie. So it could have been that DEP used its discretion to say, you know what, for power plants of this size, Reggie's got it under control. So we're going to regulate other sources because maybe, you know, maybe they agreed with you. Maybe they agreed with you that for the emissions from that sector, they were best left to a regional <coughs> That. So well, it seems to me that we would, we'd be talking about <coughs> parallel regulations of the same sector. If, if, if there was going to be regulation around uh, power plant emissions, it would be parallel to Reggie, not 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 uh, not connected to Reggie. And to the extent that uh, emissions reductions um, from power plants were, were achieved, that would uh, actually benefit a state that's in Reggie because then it has credits to sell in Reggie, right? That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that <coughs> Vermont does benefit from Reggie because we right. generate dirty electricity here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we actually sell credits. <laughs> so talk to you, you, know. you have to get, just like with renewable energy credits, you have to avoid something that is double counting. Uh, so you can't take credit for the reduction two separate ways for the same reduction. Because no, I mean, it's, not, it's not that it would be credit, it's just that if, 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 the, if, if a law is limiting aggregate emissions within the state, then um, reducing emissions from, from uh, electric generation would count towards the aggregate limit or aggregate you know, reduction, you know, the, 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 a, a lower lowering of the aggregate limit, and and they would also uh, benefit the state under under Reggie. They, 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 they seem separate to me, not not not, not the same. Can <clears throat> weigh in on that? Uh, <laughs> we there's aggregate emissions, overall emissions from all sources, right. versus aggregate emissions from a particular source. Yes. So we want to have, uh, our, in my opinion, we, we need to have aggregate emission limits from the transportation sector, aggregate emission limits from the heat, uh, heat thermal sector, right. and aggregate emissions from the electricity center. When we hear about the uh, greenhouse gas emissions report from DEC today, We'll, we'll hear that the uh, emissions from electricity have gone down, mm -hmm. but transportation and heating has gone up. Right, but it's but, um, what the Massachusetts law is doing, and what sound, seems like sound policy to me, is it's leaving it up to the agency, the, the DEP in Massachusetts, to to, uh, to, to balance that to balance the, the emissions from the various sectors in order to meet an aggregate limit, and uh, because it's secondary. Right. So, so uh, the fact that, that in, in Vermont electricity is on a downward trajectory is, is is a good thing, but that would be, you know, the, 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 the limits that the um, that uh, ANR might might place on that sector here might be uh, there might be a stretch goal for 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 it 
of generation that then adds to the uh, meeting the aggregate limit. And it's not going to be discussed. A good example of why I think the legislature deferred to DEP to wrestle with, with these <laughs> issues because you know they're so intricately involved right, in right. And that's, that's each of detail. these. The, yes. The meeting, but then we have <laughs> time or expertise to deal with. Um, if there aren't any more questions for Professor Rushlow, what I would like to um, humbly ask of you and BLS in terms of your help in looking at this. Uh, one, I'd be interested in your um, views on page 462 um, relative to what um, you found uh, helpful and challenging with the law in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, secondly, I'd be interested in, um, and I'll just say BLS, maybe it's you, or, um, but uh, an examination of some of the other Global Warming Solutions Acts at different states. I know that Connecticut has one. I'm not familiar with what other states do. Sure. But, Happy um, to do that. And what would be the most useful um, form for you to receive that information? Um, certainly written is the easiest to disseminate, mm -hmm. um, not only for this committee, but other members of the legislature that are interested in examining this as well. And certainly, I'd be interested in inviting you back to um, you know, share some of that information with us and, and take us through that. So, Happy to do that. Uh, I know you have a day job as well, um, but uh, I, I think that would be very helpful to us. OK. Happy to do that. Yeah. Any other questions at the moment? Yeah, we just, yeah. Well, you may not know this. Do you, uh, the current status of the Massachusetts Sunset language, do you know what that's being? actively pursued to I believe there have been uh, legislative, um, proposed legislation to remove the sunset or extend it. Um, I, I don't know that those have been successful, but I do, I do know the position of many in Massachusetts is that there's nothing stopping DEP from extending regulations beyond 2020. And then I have one more question, just to kind of order things in my mind. So we had the ruling from the Supreme... Supreme Judicial Court. Judicial Court. And then there were... There was an executive order. Mm -hmm. and, and also additional statutes. Regulations. Passed. Regulations. Yes. So they were done through the rulemaking process, not That's the right. statute. That's right. So the six that you listed there were rules. So we have the executive order and the new rules. That's right. Okay. And the executive order was just on the governor's initiative. Can't speak to um, exactly what you know what was going through his mind and why he felt compelled to do that, but that wasn't required by the court case. Um, I think it was. Governor Baker's way of acknowledging the court case and um, showing an effort to address those issues. <clears throat> but that was sort of above and beyond and separate from that. But the rulemaking that came out of it satisfied both, um, well, it satisfied the requirements of the GWSA. It followed from the ruling of the Supreme Judicial Court and also turned out to satisfy the executive order, which was restating what was already required on that front. The executive order was restating what was already required by the Supreme Judicial right. Court. And the executive order does some additional things related to climate, but as far as these regulations, that's what the executive order did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good morning. Good, thanks, Harry. I saw Mark downstairs and I just um, why don't we get going? Uh, okay. So I appreciate you joining us. Um, one of the things that as this committee kind of pokes around the world of Global Warming Solutions Act um, legislation, one of the important parts of uh, understanding how that would work in practice is understanding how measurement occurs of some of these things. 
mainly greenhouse gas emissions. And um, one thing that uh, I think this committee is interested in is if we forward mined, and this state was um, operating under a, a regime where we have to have um, you know fairly timely recording and data on this, how would that in fact work? So. Um, you know, I think what we're interested in is what do we do now, what might we have to do if, you know, we look forward to uh, a time where we're tracking this on, a, you know, whether it's an annual basis or every couple of years, however it mm -hmm. goes. But, um, so with that as an introduction, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And um, if you could introduce yourself for the record, uh, that would be sure. Great. Yes. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I have to testify on kind of the emissions inventory, as you, as you just mentioned. My name is Colin Smythe from uh, the DEC Air Quality and Climate Division. Um, yeah, and I've uh, kind of pr provided a couple of slides just to kind of walk through the, the basics, but um, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or anything as we go. Um, and you, you may, I wasn't sure exactly how in-depth you wanted to get on some of these sectors, yep. so I, I don't have real in-depth slides, but I'm happy to talk in-depth about the different sectors if, you, if you'd like to do that. Um, so, yeah, to kick it off, um, kind of, well, our, our little graph shows kind of our, our overall global trend, but um, kind of, uh, yeah, just an introductory slide of place we'd probably all love to be right now um, <laughs> and uh, let me uh, let me jump into the inventory here Colin, I'm sorry, sure. what are the two lines on the graph sure I believe that the black one is kind of the and I'd have to go back I'm sorry to look at the total specifics but it's the kind of the annual average um, and the red is kind of the fluctuation annual fluctuations based on generally vegetation um, uptake versus winter months. Um, so there's more sequestration during certain parts of the year than others. Um, so I could say the uh, annual fluctuation. Yeah. 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 And this is just from this one particular uh, monitoring station. There are certainly others. But, um, but this this was uh, yeah the one that popped up and looked interesting. <laughs> <coughs> so, to get into uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont, um, so the inventory is um, it's it's an estimate of uh, anthropogenic generated greenhouse gas emissions by sector, and so those are emissions that are human caused, essentially. Um, and so what the, what the inventory does is it, it attempts to provide kind of a, as comprehensive as possible and as accurate as possible a picture of our greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Um, and I listed 2008 to 2015 just because those are the years the report was, has been produced. Um, but the data itself goes from the 1990 baseline to currently 2015, and I'll get into a little bit more of why 2015 is the current year. Um, the methodologies that we use, they are consistent with, I'm going to have to read this because I'm always botched this name, the Vermont Greenhouse Gas Inventory and Reference Case Projections 1990 to 2030 study that was part of the 2007 Governor's Commission on Climate Change report, um, which was a pretty extensive report and was honestly before my time, but was something that was definitely used to kind of put this inventory together in the first place. Um, we also follow the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC guidelines for inventory creation. And um, kind of just a side note that we do coordinate with other agencies on specific data needs, uh, public service department, forest parks and recreation, and uh, definitely the use of VTRANS data um, for certain aspects of this. Um, so kind of a, an important note is this is not a measurement. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Can you just, and I apologize. Can you help me just orient myself to this conversation? Sure. So, I hope so. what department do you work for? And you are here reporting, um, and like, what is your job? And like, what are you reporting? Sure. Just being. <laughs> okay, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't cover that well enough. Um, Department of Environmental Conservation and um, in the air quality and climate section. 
um, and I work in the planning section within that. So um, my job is essentially, well, one of my jobs is to put together this, this inventory to track to track greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont through time, essentially as they relate to the goals, um, which I'll touch on in a minute, but I'm sure you're all aware of them and yeah, familiar with them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so just walk us, please, for me. Sure. Um, and the uh, I think the goals are in a slide or two. Do you, would you like me to get into them now, or That's do you? Fine. I okay. just want to make sure I'm with you. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate so the clarification. You're inventorying based on the goals that we have. Yes, um, that's, your that's the reason um, that we're that we're doing this inventory is um, kind of to track to track emissions by sector and kind of see the path that we're taking in terms of those goals. Is there any language that requires you to do that? Statutory language? Uh, yes, and I believe that I have that um, in the next slide, too. Okay, um, great. Then I, I'm happy to wait. I just want okay. to make sure. Sure. If, yeah, if I don't cover it enough, please great. please let me know. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, just kind of another note. It's, it's not an actual measurement of greenhouse gases that are emitted by any particular sector. It's an estimate that's based on generally okay. some sort of some sort of an input data like gallons of fuel used or kilowatts of electricity consumed, depends on the sector, and then an emission factor is applied to that. So it gets a little complicated depending on the sector. For example, if you have a residential boiler, that will have a certain kind of emissions profile that generates a certain amount of carbon dioxide per gallon of fuel combusted in that appliance and so it the inventory uses honestly a lot of EPA generated tools that are made specifically to capture all of the specific pieces within each sector um, and so, yeah, that's where I can get into more detail if you want, but um, but just important to note that the that it's not an actual measurement; it's an estimate based on generally fuel use. Um, so, does for your purposes is uh, wood burning considered carbon neutral? Question. Um, in this inventory, yes. Um, we do, because that is currently the EPA's stance and the IPCC stance, um, we do in the inventory report kind of give a scenario where we would account for the carbon dioxide released from wood burning through for the residential sector and for electricity generation. Um, so we do have that in the report, but we do not currently subtract that out from our gross totals, if that makes sense. You, you don't subtract it out. It out. I'm sorry, yeah, we, we don't include it. I'm, I'm sorry that, yeah, yeah. scratch that. We, we do not include that portion in there. Um, I was thinking to the, to the sequestration piece that kind of goes hand in hand with that. Right. Um, we also do not subtract out the sequestration um, because doing one without the other is, is problematic. Um, Answer your question, all right? Yes. Okay. And and do you? Uh, I'm just wondering how granular, you know, like in calculating kilowatts, do you? Is there a, a factor for transmission losses and things like that, or? Um, not and in not a right answer to this. Sure. Yeah. The the electricity sector is probably the most convoluted of the sectors. Um, we in our calculations do not account for electricity loss. Um, but when we do the electricity sector, we use the kilowatt hours that are purchased by utilities. And so I'm, I'm trying to work through this in my head, apologies for the time. But um, so we essentially apply 
we apply a factor based on the generation source, how the electricity was generated, which is information that public service has. And public service also accounts for the renewable energy credits that are sold. And so that's kind of rolled into our calculations as well. Um, and so we, we end up calculating by, by utility, the kilowatt hours used, what their generation sources that they purchased from were and are able to generate the emissions associated with those. Um, and I will just note, sorry, we're getting down the rabbit hole. For the electricity sector, though, we do consumption-based emissions, not what we generate, um, because we feel that that's kind of a more fair representation of our emissions that we're responsible for. Is that I didn't want to derail your, your uh, I appreciate the question. <laughs> 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 so yeah. can, yeah. Yeah. Another quick question about this. You mentioned that uh, the emissions are calculated generally on usage, on fuel usage. And can you say why it's generally? Or any, it, seems, um, it seems like it would be a pretty direct calculation. Yeah, maybe generally was the wrong term. I, it depends on the sector, I guess, was what I was trying to get at there. So, for example, um, the electricity sector, I guess, our fuel usage is a little different. For the waste sector, for example, it's not based on fuel usage. The waste sector. Yeah, sorry, like emissions from landfills ah, or waste sure. water. Oh, sure. It's based on kind of landfill gas generation from the landfills. Sure. So, in terms of the fuel usage itself, it's a very exact calculation yeah. based on those rates that I talked about. Okay. Thank you. Sure thing. Sure, I missed something or something. No, sorry, I probably wasn't, wasn't really clear on it. Um, any other questions before I kind of continue on? Just a clarification sure. that um, your estimates are based on consumption and don't factor in generation. Generation for electricity. So they will include generation in the state, but it's not. It's not just the emissions from the generation. So when we when we we come up with these emission factors for the different electricity generation sources, say gas turbine or whatever it may be. And we apply that to kind of all the, all the kilowatt hours that are purchased by a utility. And so I think it's probably four-fifths of those are generated outside of Vermont. But if the utility bought from a generator in Vermont, that would also be included in the calculation. Um, I, I guess the only point I was trying to make is if we only counted the emissions from the electricity we generated in the state, they'd be very small because we don't generate very much electricity in Vermont. So it's and? Yes. Yes. And I guess I have a question as well. So sure. the formula that you use for all this, all these purposes, mm -hmm. out of it, is that the same formula that's used across the country and, and the world? Um, I would have to say it depends on the sector. Um, we, we try to make it as consistent within kind of especially the region as we can because it, we realize how important it is to be able to kind of make comparisons possible between ourselves and say Massachusetts. Um, but that being said, I think it really depends on the situation because some data Massachusetts might have that we don't have available or vice versa. And so we try to balance it out and make it as kind of consistent as we can, but it's not always possible to have it exactly the same. Um, but kind of as I mentioned, the, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Guidelines, are something that pretty much, I'm going to say worldwide, inventory creators try to use to maintain that consistency that you're talking Thank about. You. Any other questions before I? Okay. Um, oh, before I move on, actually, I will note that um, 
and I think um, Jenny mentioned it in the last presentation, but the, uh, the units of these emissions are in, uh, in the report are in million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And so that is essentially saying we count carbon dioxide, which is the vast majority of all these greenhouse gas emissions, but there are other gases that are included, like she mentioned, sulfur hexafluoride, um, and I'll get into the, I think there are six that are covered. Um, and those are generally, actually, they're all more potent than carbon dioxide. And so some of them are way more potent, like sulfur hexafluoride is 22,800 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, and so it's, you end up, you end up essentially multiplying the emissions of those gases by that value, which is called their global warming potential, and I won't go into that, but it's essentially just a multiplier to make them all comparable and to carbon dioxide, so you can add them all together for your total. So carbon dioxide equivalent. Yes, you got it. Um, all right. So I guess we're going backwards a little bit here, but um, kind of why do we why do we put this inventory together? I, I kind of mentioned it's um, it's really due to state statute. Um, it was initiated under Act 209 and built on the Governor's Commission on Climate Change report in 2007 that I mentioned. We use some of the methodologies for, um, and it's like I kind of, kind of mentioned to track our progress and. Um, Kind of, it's it's a relatively high level just due to the <clears throat> data sources available, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. But um, but we try to maintain consistency and make it as as useful and accurate as possible. Um, and also we do it to kind of be a participant in kind of the regional efforts to reduce carbon dioxide and also the nationwide and the worldwide efforts to figure out a way to solve this problem. All right, so this graph, which you may or may not have seen before, is, um, is one from the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory Report, the most recent one. And um, you'll notice on kind of the left-hand axis, those are the million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And on the bottom axis is kind of all, all the years um, from the 1990 baseline, of which our goals are based on, their percent reduction goals, um, to 2015, which is the most recent inventory year. And, um, and then kind of the points farther along out in time are the, are the different statute and also the CEP goals um, and kind of the various trajectories that we would have to be on to reach those. Um, and I realize in the global warming solutions build, sounds like those may be slightly adjusted and those are obviously not shown on here, but um, but yeah, so they're, they're kind of the current, the current standing. Colin, can I take you back to that slide? Sure. Um, and uh, I'm new to this committee. Okay. And I'm also new to the legislature relative to what was going on here in 2008. So I'm not familiar with Act 209. Um, <clears throat> and maybe you're not the person to speak to this, but because you've got it on the slide, I'm going to ask you. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> um, and I want to go back and look at what uh, Act 2009 uh, prescribes, uh, not only be measured, um, but also how Governor Douglas and then maybe subsequently Governor Shumlin and um, you know how this is working with the uh, with the Scott administration now. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're here to talk about today is measurement. Um, measurement typically is part of a broader uh, strategy. You don't just measure to measure and put yeah. numbers in a drawer you measure to actually use those measures <coughs> to take action uh, or maybe develop a strategy. What, uh, and maybe this is prescribed in this act, mm -hmm. what um, 
are these numbers to be used for? What is this data to be used for? We're tracking, but is our, you know, the, the work that you're doing, <coughs> does it then move along to someone else, whether it's at DEC or ANR or the administration, to then take these numbers and say, <coughs> um, action needs to be taken, a strategy needs to be developed. Um, is, is there someone that you are working with in the administration um, that is, is taking action or, or prescribing policy based on these numbers? Is taking this data. Um, honestly, I, I can't really answer that. Um, I, I can tell you that the administration is certainly aware of this report mm -hmm. and um, they're aware of, of these values, but I, I can't really speak to what they, what they do with this data after I give it to them. Um, Look. Just to follow up on that. Sure. Um, so we have a climate change website, which I stumbled upon um, mm -hmm. this weekend um, for the state. And uh, I'm wondering, does this data feed into this? Um, what is that, you know, how is this connected to the website? And maybe this is taking us a little further afield. I see we have the deputy secretary here as well. Um, maybe you want to on this, but. Um, well, it just kind of relates to this slide again, you know, kind of what are we doing with this information? Sure, yeah. Um, the, I guess I'm not exactly sure. The website where these reports are posted is up to date. Um, I'm not sure. Which website is that? Yeah, the. So, for guys, Mr. Chair, may I jump, jump in? You. No <laughs> sure. Peter, sure. Peter Walk, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, the, the broader climate change website was a creation of a few years ago uh, that had great ambition on what it was going to include, all the sort of work that was happening around the state. Uh, it never had the resources assigned to it to actually be able to be maintained. Uh, and so it was a great snapshot in time that there simply is, a, we don't have enough time and resources in the day to be able to keep updated to the to the sufficiency that you would clearly expect from going to that website and seeing how dynamic it appears to be, but it does not, there, it, it would require significant effort to keep that uh, to the level that it started. Okay. Laura, do you have a comment? Uh, the name of the report that you, yeah, so it does appear the greenhouse gas inventory reports from 2007 are present, which is what you're reporting to us on. Is that right? Uh, I'm sorry, the 2007 on the webpage you're looking yep. at? Yep, climate change stuff from Montana. 2007 should be the bottom one here, the greenhouse yes, gas. Right yeah, so that was the governor's report that was done. Um, sorry, the the one. I was. Thank you. That Governor Douglas kind of put into play, and it's, apologies, it was before my time. But that was the one I referenced, where we use the methodologies from that report. It's it's a very comprehensively done report, um, and so I, I wasn't involved in that uh, climatechange.gov website, um, and so I'm not sure if they may link to our. Inventory reports. I'm not really sure, but so it does look like the inventory reports are on there. But some of them, are, okay. Mr. Chairman, I just ask the deputy secretary sure. one more question on this. So, is there is if, so if the climate change Vermont .gov is not where we are aggregating all of our activity and measurement of progress? Correct. Is there a website? So the website that Colin is referring you to is the divisions website within the DEC website that provides the comprehensive, comprehensive information on all of the inventory work that has been to, done to date that uh, and the, so which the climate change .gov website pulled from for that data so just one more question uh, maybe hopefully it's just one more question so the the um, why do we still have this other website up if it's getting out of date? That is a question that I can't fully answer. Who could answer that? Uh, well, I mean, 
Uh, I, we have we inherited this website when we started. We didn't have the resources to maintain it. Uh, it does have some really interesting material on it that is still of value, and I simply I don't believe in taking climate change websites down from uh, from government. So uh, I know that might come as a shock to everybody, but um, we we. And I would love to have it be regularly updated and to serve its purpose, but we simply don't have the resources to do it. Just to add that a little bit, though, but we are updating that in other places. We are updating a very small portion yeah. of that information through the work that, that Colin and his team are doing around the inventory pieces. There are lots of other pieces about that, about that website that would need to be updated on your continual basis on all the solutions work, which is really where the dynamism is happening with all the changes that you all work on, that we're working on in various state agencies and the like, that um, just simply takes resources to be able to do. And so, Colin, you is that so I'm, I'm trying I'm kind of struggling to understand so we have a website that is from a climate change website and then we have DEC compiling some information over here I'm hearing you say it would be too hard to aggregate all of the information which leads me to believe that there's a lot of work happening in this it's not too sphere. hard we simply don't we don't have anybody to do it based on the resources correct excuse me not too hard. Beyond the resources. It would be not that not that challenging, but it would require a significant level of effort to keep it maintained and to have it be useful as a as a resource. Um, and we simply don't have the resources to build. Did we have the resources at one time? Like what paid for the website? There was, to my understanding, there was never actually a plan in place on how it was going to be maintained. Can Can anybody tell us why it came to be? Uh, not in this administration. Do we have ledge council on here? I mean, would they be able to tell us? That? I don't think it. It wasn't a. It wasn't a. It was a. It was an initiative of the previous administration. It was not a legislative mandate. Okay, I promise this will be my last one because I know Colin has a lot of time. So, is there, um, is there a person um, within the administration who? Is aware of all of these bits of information. Is that you? Is that Colin? Is there, you know, because presumably there's a lot of information relative to this across departments. I I think I probably come as close to that as possible, but not. We all of the work is being done in various agencies, and so there is not a of coordinated, you know, there we have coordinating functions to look at all the work being done and make sure that we're collaborating. But to have one person being the warehouse of all that information and to be able to then articulate it in a form, one, don't have. one department, one agency, one entity. I mean, there is there any central place where this information is coming together? No. Okay. That's how it works. No. Really? I, I mean, this is, that's not dissimilar to any number of issues. When you look at the way in which we work across agencies to tackle a topic like opioid addiction, there are lots of different agencies and departments that are involved in that discussion, and no one single entity owns that whole thing. So, but we are contemplating legislation that would put our goals into statute that would really, I think, compel us and require us to have a good handle, not only on what we're doing, but what we need to do and where that work is happening and where it needs to happen. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just I'm saying current state is where this is where we are. We don't want the Conservation Law Foundation to sue us, you know, so we got to get this. Did you say? I said we don't want the Conservation Law Foundation to sue us, so we got to get this squared away. <clears throat> Sorry. Proceed. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Um, all right. So yeah, we touched on the uh, just on the goals there. Touched on kind of our, our graph here. Any any questions on that before I move on from that? Kind of our historical trend. Okay, I figured you probably had. But. <laughs> um, so I guess this will kind of give us a chance to dive a little bit deeper into these sections if you'd like. Um, so that the sectors covered in the inventory include the transportation sector, 
the residential, commercial, and industrial, call, call it RCI, um, to save, save the tongue, um, residential, commercial, industrial fuel use, agricultural sector, the electricity sector, industrial processes sector, of which we don't have a whole lot in Vermont, but we have a, a couple of major ones. Um, the waste and wastewater, and the landfills and wastewater, and the fossil fuel industry, which sounds like a really big sector, but is actually only includes kind of the transmission of really natural gas via pipeline. And so it's actually a very small, um, small percentage of the total because it's um, Vermont Gas is really the only one doing that, and it's not an extensive. System. Is that leakage, or is that yes? Okay, so that's specifically leakage. That is leakage. The use of that natural gas would be covered in the residential, commercial, industrial sector. Um, so it's kind of getting both kind of the transportation of that fuel by pipeline and the combustion of the fuel. So uh, with the sectors included in the GHG emission totals, which are estimates, mm -hmm. are you working with, what is it, six other agencies to aggregate that information? No, um, not six other agencies anyway. Um, would you like me to kind of get into a little, I feel like to answer your question, we'd have to get into a little bit of the detail. So transportation, for example, I don't work directly with VTrans, but I use reports produced by VTrans. And that data I end up as part of a separate process that's actually called the National Emissions Inventory that I have to submit data to EPA for. I give them data related to our vehicle fleet, vehicle miles traveled, fuel use, age distributions for our fleet, a whole host of different inputs. And EPA actually, and they do this for the majority of the states, models kind of the emissions for this national inventory. And so for transportation, we use that. And so so I I would be happy to work with VTrain. In particular case, I, I just use one of their reports. Um, for the residential, commercial, industrial, it's that's kind of more federal data, and that kind of gets at the data source below as well. And so to my knowledge, we don't have great data on <clears throat> fuel use broken out the way it needs to be broken out for this inventory. And so what we end up using is the kind of, it's called EIA, the Energy Information Administration data set, where regulated entity, I believe, have to report to EIA, and so it's a national level data set that gets incorporated into a lot of these different estimation tools. So that's what we use for that. Um, agriculture is kind of the same. I, I haven't really been able to connect with the Ag Department or find data from them, so it's really just the default USDA. Um, Sorry, uh, you know, US. I, I know what they are. Yeah. I know what they are. But why, my question is, why haven't you been able to connect with them? I thought that was interesting. Um, it, not to. It, no, that's that's a fair question. Um, I'm I'm just not sure who who to reach out to, honestly. And um, there are just a lot of different moving pieces. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so, clearly. Yeah. Um, electricity, we do work with PSD, um, so I do get the d data directly from them. Um, industrial processes <coughs> is, I'm not sure even what agency I would reach out to on that. We generally use um, kind of the federal greenhouse gas reporting data for that. So it captures kind of only the very largest facilities. Um, the, the big one is Global Foundries in Vermont. Um, and then waste, we do work with the waste sector on uh, kind of methodologies and um, fossil fuels again kind of a it's national a national data set to which we apply emission factors and i imagine one source of uh, <coughs> ghgs in, in the agricultural se sector would be the use of diesel or 
farm equipment? Yes. And I was just wondering about the uh, emissions from uh, <clears throat> like manure and things like that. Do, do you take that into consideration or no? Yes, kind of. It's actually the, the diesel usage is not captured in the agricultural sector. It's captured in the transportation sector is broken out into multiple subsectors. Okay. All right, so it's, it's part actually of transportation. in the okay. non-road portion of the transportation. Um, but in agriculture, yes, um, agricultural soils and tariff fermentation and manure management are the three um, there's sectors okay. covered in that. And that would generate methane, right, which uh, then would have to be converted to carbon yes. dioxide equivalents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have some questions uh, that I don't, I don't think in the time lab that we still have you could probably answer, but I would like to follow up on uh, how you're measuring uh, electricity because for me, if, it, if you're just measuring it on the consumption end, uh, the number of kilowatt hours uh, uh, that are used in, in total, um, I, I, I just have a lot of questions that, like how does, is on, on which side is net metering uh, measured? Is that, is that show up as kilowatt hours used? And, and if so, are you uh, counting the, the solar panels as a, as a, as a, uh, as, as uh, in, in terms of how much power Vermont gets from, from that source? Those, those are the kind of, kind of uh, questions uh, uh, I, I would have. And also just sure. in terms of uh, waste, just for, I'm just curious whether, how you count the emissions from the Coventry landfill, given that it's generating um, electricity and displacing some uh, some other source. So. Sure, um, uh, the electricity I will probably have to have to get back to you on. As you say, it's um, it's a little bit complex, and I'm I'm going to have to think about the net metering question a little bit. I'm I'm not an electricity expert, <laughs> but um, uh, the waste the waste I can answer for you. Um, so. In terms of Coventry, we, we use our data that is reported to the AIR division um, for the point source registration. They submit every year the amount of landfill gas that is generated. And they also submit reports from the entities running the engines. And so we're able to kind of get at the we, we make some assumptions on fugitive emission rates, which I think they actually estimate as well um, in their reporting. But we kind of, we essentially say that if it's combusted in the engine at, I believe, 98% efficiency, that we, we don't include that carbon dioxide because it's considered biogenic, um, which is kind of a whole other issue with this inventory, but those are the, those are the guidelines. And so, so you generate methane, a lot of that, 85% of that is captured and, and burned in these engines, which have like a 98% efficiency. And so you end up with a very kind of a small percentage that you actually count that doesn't get combusted or is fugitive. Um, Hopefully that answered your question that's, a little bit anyway. That's what I, I, that's what I was hoping to hear. So. Okay, good. Um, any other questions before I continue? Uh, I do have one more question. Um, you, you mentioned that you're not an electric, electricity expert, so you, de you depend on the public service department to do the calculations for the electricity sector? No, <coughs> but... Um, we depend on the public service department to give us the data, kind of as I mentioned before, by utility, by generation yeah. source. Yeah. And they account for the recs taken out. That's the part that I don't have anything to do with and don't totally understand how they do that process. Um, but what they end up giving us is, is then usable. And the, the general process is we take we are able to derive emissions factors from the ISO New England grid mix that they report and apply those emission factors 
kind of we average an annual emission factor for a specific generation source and apply that to all the kilowatt hours. And so it's a relatively straightforward calculation at that point. Um, and so, yeah, we, we have gone over that methodology with the Public Service Department and they kind of helped us yeah. work on that. I would imagine that, that that's fairly accurate because any solar being generated through net metering is, a lot, is mostly behind the meter and that basically reduces demand. So if you're not, mm -hmm. if you're not um, consuming electricity from the grid, then it, which is, well, if you're not consuming electricity from the grid, then you're, since solar is you're not <coughs> carbon producing, you're, uh, so that would kind of be accounted yeah. for as well. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. <clears throat> Great. I don't articulate that. It's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions on that? Or? All right. Um, I guess just I think we're getting close to the end of these slides here, but <laughs> just to touch briefly on the gases covered that I mentioned, there were, um, yeah, I think, seven now. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, which actually encompass kind of a wide range of gas, and same with perfluorocarbons. Um, sulfur hexafluoride, which I mentioned, and nitrogen trifluoride was kind of a recent addition that is becoming more of a known issue. Um, there are more emissions than people had realized, and it's also got a very high multiplier. Um, I think it's 17,200 or something like that. It's what, is, what does that come from? What does that cause by? Honestly, I'm not sure all the sources. I know that it, there's some of it, I believe, in semiconductor manufacturing process, but I don't believe that's the only source for that one. Um, for sulfur hexafluoride, um, it is, they, that is also kind of a product of semiconductor manufacturing, but also um, maybe not a product of, but incorporated into the process, a necessary component. Um, but also with the electricity distribution lines that were mentioned in the last presentation, kind of insulating purposes for that. Um, but as I mentioned, all those other than carbon dioxide have multipliers and some are more than others. Um, um, two questions. So one is um, realizing that you're working with a wide variety of sources, not doing actual measurement yourself. And, uh, and knowing that I see things in the media like uh, you know, fugitive emissions from Boston's natural gas system, mm -hmm. initially estimated at 1.7%, now estimated somewhere near 5%, I think, or, you know, so we're talking about a 300% increase. Um, just wondering about the degree of confidence in your numbers, in numbers. <laughs> sure, that, that's a fair question. Um, I think a lot of times it really just depends on the sector. In terms of the natural gas distribution, um, I don't have data kind of specifically on the accuracy of it. Um, and I, I guess as, as a related question, sure, is the is the overall our overall emissions large enough and diverse enough that any errors in any one sector are sort of absorbed broadly, or is there something that would really skew the numbers? Um, I think I would say that it's likely absorbed, at least to some degree. Um, our total emissions are not incredibly high, even though we are kind of going in the wrong direction. Um, uh, but there, there's been a fair amount of kind of scrutiny of these methodologies and all these regional and even worldwide groups trying not to miss particular sectors or particular pieces that should be incorporated. Um, in terms of the data quality, I honestly don't know. We, we kind of do the best we can and we try to make sure everything makes sense. But, um, but in terms of looking at 
a national data set on fuel consumption. I don't have any way to know whether or not that's correct or not. Um, and then one more related question with addition of things like nitrogen trifluoride and mm -hmm. um, recognition of sulfur hexafluoride. So changes in, in what you're measuring and the recognition of their impact. Mm -hmm. um, does that, I'm, I'm trying to phrase this properly, um, how does that affect the 1990 baseline assumptions? Yeah, that's definitely a fair question. Um, so that's sometimes a little bit difficult to handle. Um, we try in those instances to, we hope that when that happens, there's a good enough data source to kind of tell us what has been going on since 1990. We always try to update all the way back because if we didn't, like you suggest, it would skew kind of where we need to get to if we just adjusted the most recent emissions. Um, so we always try to either project it back or hopefully have a good enough data source to go back that far and add it in. Okay. Um, but we're definitely very aware of that. Um, yes, hopefully that's the answer to you. Sure thing. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, not too much. Um, I, I guess I touched on some of these before, so I won't go over them again. But um, the data sources, um, I, I touched on the National Emissions Inventory, and just kind of making the point that, that a lot of these are national level data sets that we don't have a whole lot of control over and can't always be entirely sure of the accuracy of. Um, but we, we do the best we can to make sure they make sense and are consistent through time. Generally speaking, um, is the consensus that most of these are kind of accurate, some are kind of high, some are kind of low, uh, any particular uh, corrections that the industry might use as a whole on a particular data set? Yeah, not, not really that I'm aware of. Um, Trying to think if there's, yeah, I, th I think it's kind of if if they find something, some inconsistency, and say they, if kind of one of these regional groups or a particular state finds something, they'll point it out to everybody and say you should be aware of this, <laughs> just kind of to take it into account to maintain the consistency. But I don't think there's any kind of red flag ones that are that are consistent uh, that I know of anyway. Sure. Um, so the, the graph that you showed us of our total emissions, yes. do you also graph by sector? Yes. So we can see if a particular sector is Yep, that is spiking. all in the, uh, in the reports um, that I, I linked to in here, but I'd be happy to, to send you the actual reports if you would like to see those two. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Sure thing. I'm going to insert a related question here. Do you also, uh, I the answer is yes, but um, do you present the data by gas? Yeah. Do we see that, um, you know, while we're tracking things per, you know, ton of, of carbon, um, really where our issue is, is in methane. And it's, it's so much more of a problematic gas emission relative to carbon dioxide that even though the volume may be smaller, the effect is significant. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, we, we do not present it that way. Um, I do have it that way. I just haven't kind of compiled it in that fashion, and we've always kind of done it by sector. But um, we do occasionally get questions on kind of the total carbon dioxide. And so I essentially just have to go back in and tally up all the CO2 specific pieces. The reason I asked the question, and then you added to this this morning, um, and our prior witness had um, spoken to it as well. I've never heard of sulfur hexafluoride before, yeah. um, but was impressed by what a problematic gas it is. And you've also you know, talked about some of these other gases that we measure and their relative harm mm -hmm. um, to carbon dioxide. And that, that's why I ask, you know, even yeah. from a volume standpoint, they might be quite small from an actual effect. And I understand that's captured in the total amount, but... Um, yeah. Uh, you my question. For sure, no, and, and that's that's definitely fair. And um, I, to kind of expand on that, 
Um, I think methane is definitely second to carbon dioxide, but even methane is a relatively small portion. It's not tiny, but it's relatively small compared to carbon dioxide. Um, these other gases are definitely, especially the sulfur hexafluoride, nitrogen trifluoride, and some of the HFCs and BFCs, they're definitely very important because they are so much more potent and they tend to last a long time in the atmosphere as well. So it's kind of a double whammy and so they may not have the kind of immediate threat that carbon dioxide has, but they're they're definitely important because of that fact. Um, allowing wood build up is definitely detrimental. So I'd like to go down two slides to the table. Sure. <coughs> to this one? Look, look at the different sectors and what the, um, I think the last column, I don't know, is this the one that tells you uh, whether it's increased or decreased uh, over time? At the bottom. Bottom line. Kind of whether the total, yeah. 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 But, um, for each of the sectors, each, some of the sectors have actually decreased their emissions. Other sectors have increased, and I think yes. you can see the biggest increase is in transportation and heat. Yep, those are those are definitely two of the bigger ones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So by sector, uh, talking about you know whether it's increased or decreased. For instance, uh, electricity supply and demand has gone from 1.09 in 1990 down to 1.00. Yeah, sorry, let me find that one. That's tough. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> Residential, commercial, <coughs> industrial fuel use has gone from 2.41 up to 2.78. Yep. That's the heating fuel, right? Right. Heating. Transportation went from 3.38 to 4.33. Biggest jump, I think. Yep. Fossil fuel industry, 0 0.0077 to Point zero zero five zero, so that's gone down. And industrial processes went to one to point five eight. Significant increase, but not that much of a contribution. Right. Waste management point two seven. Do you have a question? One to seven. No, I'm just going over this for oh. the education of the committee. <laughs> 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 and agriculture uh, one point two two down to one point one four, so that was a decrease. And we're up point, and we're up sixteen percent over nineteen ninety. Total gross. <coughs> yeah. Your question there. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. So. Sure, I can go back and touch on. I think I've kind of, uh, I've kind of touched on it already. Okay. Um, just the data sources, mm -hmm. and that's that's generally why, it's why only through 2015 is the current inventory, and um, because a lot of these large data sources <laughs> take a long time for these agencies to compile and QA, make sure everything looks all right. It takes them a long time to get them out and. The same is kind of true a lot of times for some of the tools that EPA puts out for us to help us all calculate these emissions. Um, and so that that's why the lag time. Um, and uh, that being said, 2016 is probably, the data is probably there or just about there, so I'll be trying to put that together probably in the next couple of months here. But um, I'll have to, yeah, kind of double check on, double check on all the sources and make sure they're all Set. How often do you issue, issue a report like this? Generally, it's every year. Every year. Um, yeah, it, it gets a little bit complicated, especially with transportation, because one, it's the biggest contributing sector, and since we base it on the National Emissions Inventory, which unfortunately is only every three years, we have to try to accurately project between years or going forward. Um, like right now, they're working on the 2017 National Emissions Inventory, and so 
that's expected to be out in 2020 sometime, I think. And so we'll either have to wait to put that number in or give it our best estimate and, um, and either revisit it later or, yeah, kind of update it. Um, but, but yeah, so there are a lot of, a lot of moving pieces in there. Does the Energy Information Administration, um, don't they compile um, fossil fuel usage? Uh, do they compile it on a monthly basis? Or you know, I'm not sure about that. Basis they, it could be mine. I'm not sure, honestly. They definitely <clears throat> have it yearly, um, but it could certainly be more. Well, they can give you figures on how much is imported into a particular state, like Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, which you assume, I guess, if it's imported into a state that it's consumed. Yeah. Good assumption. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, I, yeah, I think there's potential issues with people getting it and driving out of state or filling up out of state and driving in in terms of the transportation uh, stuff that's a little bit hard to account for. Um, there's a lot of oil stored in people's Devils in the details, yeah. But, but it, 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 eventually there's a steady state and then anything coming in is going to be consumed. And, so yeah. Great. Any other any other questions on that? Just I, I go, I'm going to go back to my other. Who do you who do you work with primarily? Who do I work with on this inventory? Yeah. In terms of kind of other DC people or other agencies in general. Or, in general. I put this inventory together essentially myself and my supervisor was doing it before me, but we we collaborate with public service and forest parks and recreation on the um, on the sequestration part of it um, and the waste sector if we should have any specific questions. Um, so we, we definitely reach out when when there is a need, but a lot of these methodologies have kind of Honestly, it was before my time. I was, I've only been here a few years, but um, my supervisor previously was doing this, and he definitely reached out and kind of came up with these methodologies with these other agencies. And so I'm assuming they told him the appropriate data sets and everything like that. To so use. Uh, just with regard to our bill, 462, mm -hmm. and how this information is... Um, coming in and being estimated, mm -hmm. and then what 462 really compels us to do, which is, you know, put the statute's um, requirements. I'm, I'm feeling like there's some disconnection here that might need to be addressed as part of that. Um, yes? Sorry, in terms uh, of... So it feels the like you're, you're measuring, um, so we're talking about putting into Vermont statute something that requires us to make progress on lowering our emissions. Mm -hmm. And the right now we're measuring our emissions in, and it's not completely connected to all of our emissions lowering programs, I think. So I mean, it's, it's more right now it's, it's connected to the, the data and not any efforts or programs or things that are happening. Do you understand what I'm saying? Am I messing this up? Yeah, I think they're two different, two separate things. Yeah. You're, you're measuring uh, to the extent you can compile the data um, yeah. where we think Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions are. Full stop. <coughs> right. right. I, I, sorry, I think to get at your question a little bit, because um, I, I think our hope is that the programs that are being implemented would reflect or would be reflected in these totals. So if you had a program to reduce residential fuel use by fuel switching or something like that, we would hope that that would be picked up in our data set and so those emissions wouldn't be counted. But it depends on how granular you're going to get. Right, and I think this legislation is us saying we probably need to stop over 
Yeah, I, I'm not even, I'm not sure how to answer that one. Well, it's, it's more of a, just, it's more just, yeah. I'm kind of trying to work through this in my yeah. head, so. So Colin, a question that I want to um, ask you very specifically, Robin had kind of um, asked it, it's okay, you can go ahead. Um, uh, I but it's the same I, answer. Well, I want, <laughs> uh, uh, I want to use really small words <laughs> so that I can understand it. Um, when we look at your slide uh, four, which shows the, the um, trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions over time, this one, yep. um, and we consider some of the greenhouse gases that have been taken into account. Um, for example, is the 2014 figure that you come up with, is that an apples to apples comparison with um, the measurement that was done in 1995, for example? Because you know, some of the players on the field with regard to gases have changed. It is as close as we can make it. Um, I, I, would, I would say yes, without looking at the actual you know, nitty-gritty details, yep. I'd have a hard time kind of swearing to that. But, um, but we certainly, if, if there's a change that we have to implement in the current year, say they find a new gas, we, we always try to say, well, how much of that was was emitted back in 1990, and what would that like? How much would we have to essentially add to each year to incorporate that new finding? Because it's a legitimate emission that was there up each year. We just never realized it was there before. Um, so we certainly try, um, but sometimes the data is there and sometimes it's not. So okay. some of those estimates are better. So they have lobby and lunch bell. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Tim, I might be able to put a fine point on that. Oftentimes the the science around a global warming potential, that, that emission factor for a yeah. chemicals changes. And so then we'll go back and adjust the, in, the inventory from previous year, so that, so that in 2015, if something changed, we show what changed and how that impacted. We're not going to necessarily change the reports back from previous years. That's why the current version is so important because right. it reflects all the changes. But the graph may change. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So Good point. Yeah. Robin, how many copies did you print? Six. Okay. All the same. I hope. Zachary, can you join us? Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us and thanks for this work you've done. I actually haven't read this yet. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, fun. So I'm, I'm pleased that you could be here to take, take us through this. Um, you probably said in here a few times, if you wouldn't mind um, introducing yourself for the record because we're taping this, and then um, the, you know, the floor is yours to, to take us through this. I'm going to pull this up while you got it up there. Thanks, yeah. Dan. So um, my name is Zach Hamilton, for those of you who I haven't met, and I'm a student at the University of Vermont. Um, I've been around the committee this semester. I've been working with uh, Representative Yantachka and um, my professor, um, Claire Ginger, who is teaching a course in public <laughs> service, um, is, um, is here with us today as well. Um, and so the report that you have in front of you is um, focused on the idea of using the Clean Energy Development Fund as a vehicle for um, administering an electric vehicle incentive program. Um, and I'd really like to update you on the status of the fund, because I'm not sure if that's something you've been briefed on um, at all recently, um, but uh, the available uh, money in the fund uh, has dwindled over the years, and uh, there's been a focus on advancing the uh, advanced wood heating market. Um, and so I'm going to try and show how the Clean Energy Development Fund uh, and Electric Vehicle Incentive Program can be similar um, to um, the advanced wood heating schemes um, in rebate systems. Uh, so yeah, I'll jump in by um, walking you through the report and interrupt me if you guys have any questions. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the um, CEDF is administered through the Department of Public Service. Um, it contains an advisory committee, um, the Clean Energy Development Board, um, and members of the board are appointed um, by the legislature. Um, the chair um, is um, Andrew Duvall, who we've heard testimony from, I think, this session, uh, and the co-chair, Sam Swanson, um, who 
works um, for the Pace um, for Pace Law School. Works remotely in Vermont, um, and I talked to him, um, had some conversations. So um, I draw um, from those in this report. Uh, there's a fund manager who is a full-time staffer from um, the Department of Public Service, and that fund manager is um, Andrew Perchlick, who um, is also now um, an active senator um, in the Vermont State Senate. So there have been conflicts with he's not able to work full-time um, any longer on the CEDF um, because of his role in the Senate, um, which uh, might be basically with uh, an advent of a new program might be difficult and would need to be navigated um, with his part-time roles. Um, so moving forward, um, the multi-year strategic plan uh, published in 2018 uh, for the CEDF um, says that basically talks a lot about the funding says that it may be powered down. Uh, I, I have the scrolling powers here, don't I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You do. Okay. Um, so talking about the fund manager, um, it's all in the report. And here um, we have um, some quotes from the um, multi-year strategic plan. Um, and then in my conversations with Sam Swanson, um, the co-chair, he basically told me that the Clean Energy Development Board is not, um, they're not advocating or searching for new sources of funding. Um, that's not their job. Their job is to manage what funds come to them um, that are appropriated by the legislature. Um, so I'm going to step back for a second and say that um, the majority of money um, that was used to fund the CEDF in the past came from regular payments by Vermont Yankee um, and through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, which some of those dollars are still available for deployment, um, but the Vermont Yankee funds, the last one um, came in, I think it was 2014, um, through a large, um, a large sum from the legislature as well. Um, and as I said, uh, you look through some of their, um, their funding models for the next, next fiscal year, and over time and um, the money has dropped significantly. Most of the income is, comes from existing loan repayments um, from past projects. Um, so this is why um, I've compiled this report. I'm using the Volkswagen um, and other, uh, other automobile settlement funds um, to help bring back the CEDF and add a new program for electric vehicles. Here um, we have some of the types of programs that the CEDF runs. Um, and we're going to be looking mostly at um, their rebates. Um, and uh, because a lot of existing electric vehicle incentives come in the form of rebates or tax credits, um, the, um, I really looked at how um, the CEDF has administered some of those heating um, incentive programs on a small scale um, and um, they could um, and well I'll get to this in a second but at the Clean Energy Development Board meeting um, which was held a few weeks ago um, they talked about how their prior experience issuing rebates on a small scale ask for it you get it policy um, would work pretty well for electric vehicle program that makes sense. Are there something, any questions? Is that something you're actively considering at this, at this meeting? Yeah, so um, in this meeting they took um, a good chunk of time to talk about um, current legislation. They know, they've heard um, rumors in the State House of um, using um, this money for um, the settlement dollars for um, electric vehicles, something the governor has expressed interest in bringing more EVs online. Um, and they're like different parties um, competing. I'm not sure what the current status is of the funds. It sounds like it's still in budget considerations. Um, but they said that if they were given the money, they could start a program. And the administrative costs to do so would probably be lower than 
than if, like, say, the agency of transportation were to start a whole new process because it's a complicated um, establishing um, and like calculating costs um, for like incentives, like what works well economically is a complicated process, something I don't know a whole lot about, um, but they have experience doing that. And so, um, it is the issue that, and I, I don't know anything about it either, but is the issue that you're trying to anticipate what the uptake is, and so that you need a sufficient pool of funds to accommodate that, um, or that um, if you don't uh, um, sufficiently understand what the uptake is going to be, you're going to run out of incentive dollars and maybe cause uh, the opposite reaction, which mm -hmm. is kind of discouragement in purchasing a, a vehicle. Yeah, I think, well, obviously you want the money in the pot so that you can um, ensure um, that you can promise that um, these incentives will work um, or be given out yeah. um, and also to come recover some of those administrative costs like the hiring of, um, of <laughs> um, staffer yeah. um, which they said would most likely be necessary mm -hmm. which would be necessary um, to administer the program yeah. um, but basically they would um, the way they would do this is by um, probably um, consulting with uh, or like going to other groups in the state, other utilities, um, and saying, here's this money, help us set up a program. And um, they would coordinate that, um, they would coordinate the communication and the, um, the work between the utilities. Or, uh, and their customers. And their customers, yeah, exactly. And that's how they've done it with the small scale renewable energy incentive program, is they've gone through like Efficiency Vermont um, and other um, and other groups and made contracts um, for that. Um, in the meeting, like I said, um, Jared Duval um, was the one who answered the two big questions. Um, is the CEDF eligible, just like in the statutory requirements? Um, is it eligible for an electric vehicle program? The answer is yes. And Second, are the um, American Recovering Reinvestment Act funds available for deployment? And he said yes as well. Um, and then talking about how they would model it off of their um, past programs. And then here, um, towards the end, I just added a section on existing um, incentive programs in the state. Um, and the federal government tax credit program, um, just to show that these programs do exist. They have often come in the form of rebates around the, around the country. A lot of municipalities, a lot of states are interested in bringing more electric vehicles online. Um, so I just added in this section to show um, how it is, how these programs are feasible um, and like they do take money summarizes that um, and really um, the main points that I want to hit home in this report are the lack of funding for the CEDF and bring that to your attention um, like I said with my conversations with Sam Swanson um, they're not gonna actively come here and say we need money um, but that people should be aware that um, these programs and the intent of the CEDF is um, being phased out over time. Um, currently, there is a um, study in progress. Um, the Cadmus Consulting Group is working on their 2020 budget. That should be available in May or June, um, depending on if they get it out in time. Um, and that should answer a lot more of these questions about the future for the CEDF. Scott, did you have a question? I was just going to ask uh, about how much money is left. And we have to wait for Cadmus to, to tell us. Do you have any idea, or? Yeah, yeah they have enough money to um, continue their um, advanced wood heating program. Um, the um, the main um, small scale um, small scale program, um, and then, like I said, from the 2018 report, it's likely that in the next year or so they'll run out of money. 
I don't have specific figures for okay. it. Okay. Oh, and, and error money in particular. You don't, you don't know how much error money they have. Right. Thanks. I can recommend um, that you s might speak to someone mm -hmm. at um, the Public Service Department. Yep. Um, Ed Delhagen works closely and is on the CEDF board. Um, and he does a lot of managing of the funds. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say uh, <clears throat> thank you for doing this uh, work, for doing that research and everything. Um, i got to say that Zach uh, took this on his own, uh, did a great job, I think, uh, talking to, I appointed him uh, to a couple of people to talk to, and he ran from there. Uh, so it was a tremendous part of an issue on his part to do this. And, uh, Appreciate the uh, ability to work with you. Yeah, thank you for coming out and showing me around the state house <coughs> semester. It's been a blast sitting in on your conversations, and hopefully this sparks conversation. Obviously, well, it's been ongoing about um, electric vehicles or just the electrification of the transportation sector. If we are to meet the uh, meet Vermont's energy and climate goals, so, yeah. I hope this is. Um, do you know? Uh, thank you for doing this. Do you, do you know in this in the budget that we just passed? So there's a million and a half for EV incentives. But is that um, administered by VTrans? I I, I, I don't want to um, state for the record because I'm not entirely sure. Um, but that would be my best guess. It's not in here, right? And, and I'm, I'm sorry, but you said you thought that, that uh, CEDF could could administer a program more cheaply. Yes, that is. Than VTrans getting something like that. Yeah, that's um, basically what I came to the conclusion of. And um, at the um, discussion of the in the CED um, board, um, basically they they all think that they could do this um, at a lesser cost than an agency that's never administered small incentives before. Yeah, I, I uh, spoke with uh, some members of VTrans, uh, actually Michelle Blumhauer, and uh, <clears throat> mentioned the possibility of using CEDF as a vehicle for a rebate program. And, uh, I think they're, what I heard uh, informally was that uh, Agency of Transportation may contract was what, an entity to administer a rebate program, and mm -hmm. CEDF is one possibility that they might contract with. Yeah, and I, sh I should add that um, one of their concerns was being micromanaged by um, another entity, um, such as VTrans, but uh, at the same time, they are willing to work um, mm -hmm. together. And are the um, members of the CEDF board uh, are they volunteer or are they paid, do you know? They're all volunteer, um, with the exception of the fund manager. Right. Okay. And Ed We, as you know, spent a long time around this table wishing that um, lawsuit settlement money could be directed for specific causes mm -hmm. um, and discovering that Mostly, it can't. Uh, do you have? I mean, it, so you know, the Volkswagen stuff, the 4.5 million makes perfect sense. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Same with the uh, the Fiat and uh, Bosch. Um, have you had discussions with anybody about other sources of funding or or consistent sources of funding before this? Yes, yeah, so one thing that um, Representative Yantashka and I have discussed um, a little bit this semester is um, a two cent um, increase on the gas tax um, to help um, bring in money. Um, there's also, um, I mean, you can look at um, other, how other municipalities and how other states have generated revenue. There's another student actually in my class who's working on um, the best methods for um, implementing electric vehicles and 
um, one thing that she's looking into is the sources of funding. Just something I mentioned conversationally and as opinion, um, which is uh, it's really hard to squeeze money out of the budget. Exactly. No. And I know one way to guarantee not to get money in the budget, which is to refuse to advocate for it. <laughs> and um, you know, I question that as a strategy um, by the Clean Energy mm -hmm. Development Board to say, mm -hmm. just send us the money. We're not going to have it. <laughs> it's uh, um, well. I think the numbers in that fund speak for themselves in terms of how much money's been placed there. Mm -hmm. When they had thirty million dollars, they <laughs> did a lot of great work. Yeah. Unfortunately, they've had to slow down. Yeah, I get it. Is there uh, in their charge or in their makeup a provision about if the amount of money reaches a certain level that they have to uh, disband or get, no? No. I thought there was some sort of okay. nothing Thanks. that I've read. Is your question if it gets to a, a, a low enough level? Right, yeah. if you're just funding the. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions for Zach? Great. Thank you. Again, Thank you. I really appreciate Thanks you guys inviting me in here today. Thanks, Ari. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking your time. What's your major? I'm environmental studies. So, um, what was not on our schedule this afternoon, but um, since we had I, I, earlier this week and last Friday, I was anticipating we were going to be on the floor a long time today, so we didn't have a uh, robust schedule, and um, I thought Heidi was going to be um, still <laughs> wording. <laughs> I rode a fat bike. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, kind but, of hard with these shoes, though. I asked Luke if he could join us um, to take us through um, H366. Um, we'll just go on our wall and, again, just do a walk through on this. And I appreciate you being able to. Um, adjust your schedule to do that. So um, this is the last thing our schedule today, but I, I thought we'd use it. But, um, go through another bill. So thanks for joining us. Our things going the right side already. Hold on. All right. I'll clean up. Everything's back in my car. Thank you very much, Luke Martland from Legislative Council. And good afternoon, everybody. I've been asked to do a quick walk through uh, page 366. Um, I have it on the screen, but I'd like to step back for a moment and actually talk about Law in 30 VSA 8005 small a, which pertains to the standard offer program. That's not on your screen. This is existing law. Uh, 8005A uh, pertains to the standard offer program, and there's language in a subdivision of that law uh, concerning pilot projects. And it states that um, for one year commencing on January 1st, 2017, so the year has lapsed, uh, the Public Utilities Commission would allocate one-sixth of the increase in the standard offer program to new plants located in one or more preferred sites. So the key word is preferred sites, key phrase. And uh, that are not parking lots or canopies above parking lots. And an additional one-sixth to parking projects on parking lots or on canopies above parking lots. Now you heard testimony about standard order for the program, and when that testimony was given, the key word was contract, if you remember, it was a couple weeks ago. And the whole idea of the standard offer program was to incentivize developments of renewable um, energy and renewable plants. So what this bill does is it carries forward a similar idea and a similar term. So this pilot project has lapsed, is in the statutes, but it's no longer in effect. Um, and preferred location is defined in that old law, and it includes uh, energy projects that fall within one of the nine criteria, including uh, brownfield, a project on a landfill, or on a gravel pit or quarry. Now what H366 does is four main things. First of all, it requires the Public Utilities Commission to develop a simplified process to seek approval to build a plan at a, quote, priority site. <laughs> 
and a priority site is largely defined in a way that's very similar to the old preferred location. Okay. It defines uh, them in a very similar way. Um, it also requires the PUC to establish a registration process for projects mounted on a roof or a parking canopy that are 15 kilowatts or less. And then last but not least, it sets time frames for the PUC to decide on net metering projects. So those are the four main things that this bill does. I'm giving you a little background about old law that's still in the books that has similar terms. And now I'll go through the language of the statute itself. Yes. Sorry, but it's all solar we're talking about then, no? Uh, for, it is net metering. Um, 248 is more than solar. Yeah. Okay. Um, let, let me actually, as I go through, let me okay. uh, try to answer that question. I think some of it does, and I think some of it may not. Okay. Let me try to, and that may be something to follow up on. But as to the time, let's excuse me. Um, can you clarify for me, so the, uh, the section that sunsetted, yep. um, which included reserving two-sixths yep. of the allocation. Yep. Um, does this, they'll continue to reserve those two-sixths? No, so it is different, um, but it has a similar term of art that's mm -hmm. defined in a very similar way, but is different. So 8005, um, what I referred to, 8005A, is a standard offer program. Mm -hmm. So that um, pertained only to standard offer contracts and required the PUC to reserve a certain proportion of any increase under the standard right. offer program for um, what was called uh, sites on priority lo uh, preferred locations and then another six for canopies or parking lot sites. And then it had a definition of that term. That's expired. That was for one year starting on January 1st, 2017. So it is done. This bill has a slightly different term that's defined in a very similar way, but it's broader in its impact. And then it does some other things that are different. The, uh, the so standard offer has divvies up the, the contracts. There's small hydro. Yep. Couple of sections of, or there were a couple of sections of solar. Mm -hmm. What does that do to the the pie and the slices that it's cut into? Or what is the status of that pie now that those two one sixths have? I, can't, I don't know the answer to that question. So um, that program's lapsed. What was approved under the program or not approved? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. But the PUC might be able to. I don't know. This is where this is your, where you're going, but. The reason you're bringing this up is because the definition from this lapsed program is relevant to how this, stat, this yes. bill was drafted. Well, there's more background that there was a similar concept, yeah. similar term of art, designed in a, defined in a very okay. similar way. As a pilot project, I don't know how right. successful so, it was. Um, that's lapsed, and now there's a proposal in this bill to carry forward that concept, but it is different. So, so my question is about standard offers sure. actually don't relate to this bill. Okay. Right? I mean, is that correct that this bill doesn't relate to standard offers? Uh, it just, goes beyond standard yeah. offer, yes. Okay. So then I'm then I will stop distracting you. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's talk about standard offer. <laughs> well okay. <laughs> To tell you the truth, I was wondering how standard offer fit into the standard <laughs> offer. It's, it's the concept yeah. and the definition, uh -huh. it's background. Yeah. But it's when people talk about this, it's based on what was tried previously. Yeah. 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 So let's begin with section one, and I have the bill on the screen. Uh, so this is 30 VSA 248. So this is the overall statute that uh, so-called section 248 that concerns with uh, approving projects the granting of a certificate of public good. What it does is it adds a new subsection U, which reads as follows. For priority sites, as defined in 8002, so that's the next thing we'll get to, the commission shall, number one, 
establish a simplified processes that shall reduce the cost and time associated with an application and to encourage the construction of plants on priority sites. So that's the first thing that the POC is ordered to do. And then second, establish a registration process for a plant of any size mounted on a roof or parking canopy and for a plant of 15 kilowatts or less. So it is a registration process for a plant of any size that's on a roof or parking canopy and a plant of 15 kilowatts or less, wherever that may be. So there's two separate groups there. And under that registration process, a certificate of public good shall be deemed issued unless the interconnecting retail provider submits within a period to be prescribed by the commission a letter raising interconnection issues. Question. Uh, Mr. Chair, should I call them or do you want to Yeah, call no, them? please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, is this uh, standard? So I think what I'm reading here is the CPG will be deemed to be issued yep. unless some unless there's a, a request by the utility not to you know to have further. Is that, does that exist elsewhere? Do we know if that's common practice or, pra or in practice for other CPGs anywhere? Um, there is actually under the, I'll get to it in a moment, under okay. the rule of the PUC for certain projects, some smaller projects, for example, it's a process where it's deemed approved unless there's a letter from the interconnecting uh, utility raising a concern. So this is, so this, this is once again, carrying, taking an existing concept and- And adding the priority Yes, I get this. Yes. To the existing yes. practice. Correct. So it's sort of taking existing concepts and mixing them together in a slightly different way, perhaps slightly broader way. Yeah. Yes. So, so if it's if it's if the only party that can raise a concern is the uh, the utility that it's connected <laughs> to, mm -hmm. that that rule would rule out a neighbor that had a concern about the project. <coughs> Under this language, you are correct. So under this language, unless there's something else that, um, that I'm not aware of. Um, it seems that only on that basis could the objection raised. Now this, once again, is for a project on a roof or parking canopy or a project of 15 kilowatts or less. So it's smaller size in theory. Question for kind of the solar heads. Uh, 15 kilowatts is about 100 by 100 foot Square? Does that sound about right? Yeah. Yeah. I can see a neighbor objecting. Well, it's probably not 100. It's 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 three trackers. I have two trackers, and they're each five. Okay. And the, uh, how big's a tracker? Uh, I'm giving you a rough guess now, but it's probably uh, 12 feet by 12 feet. Oh, well, wow. it's taller. So maybe this. Yeah, so I mean, it's 15 12, feet by 12 feet or something like that. 16 okay. feet by yeah. So that's small. Okay. So we're about to move on to section two, but just to recap section one, new law that requires the PUC for priority sites to establish a simplified process. Okay, clear? Sure. Section two. This is really uh, findings language. And usually this is not in the codified statutes in the so-called green books. In Title 30, a lot of it is. And so what I did is just amend that existing findings to include the new nine. And it really is a tenth of the legislature type language that um, you'd be put in law that mandatory time frames are um, a positive thing. So this doesn't bind. This doesn't really do much. It's more expressions of legislative intent. Right. Section three. This is amending 30 VSA 8002. Um, and what this basically does is give the definition of a priority site, which was the key term of art that was used in section one. Most of these criteria are either identical to or substantially the same as the preferred location definition used in that lapse law that I mentioned earlier. 
and includes if you just run down an A, a newer existing structure. So this would be, a, for example, a solar panel placed on a newer existing structure whose primary use is not the generation of electricity or providing support for equipment that generates electricity, a canopy over a parking lot. Um, there's language about uh, tract previously developed for use other than siting a plant. Um, under D, land certified by the Secretary of Natural Resources to be a brownfield, that's nearly identical to the language in the prior law. Sanitary, sanitary landfill language in E and the gravel pit and quarry language in F are very similar to the language in that, that other law that I mentioned earlier. G concerns a location that a municipality has determined is appropriate for a plant. So it's an area that they wish to put a plant on. In H, you have language about the um, Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act and uh, EPA. Um, I'm not certain what that is. That's something I didn't have a chance to research before I came here today. I'm sure someone else can answer it. I could look into it. So. Yep. Any question? Yep. Yeah, I think that's uh, super fun. Size. That's super fun. Gotcha. <coughs> are, we, are we still talking about the small under 15 uh, AW? Well, 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 this is a definition of priority site, but it's relevant because of section one, where you want the simplified process for a priority site um, and a registration process for certain projects on a priority site. So that's how it connects. I mean, this could be used in other contexts for the purposes of this bill. It's, that's how it's relevant, right? So, I mean, in other words, so what, you could have a very large brownfield site. Really, it's only relevant if there's a, um, a simplified pro process for a project um, on such a site and a registration process for smaller projects on that site. So this is just, yeah. this is for, regardless of the type of site, this is for the smaller projects that are eligible for the registration process, as opposed to a larger uh, standard offer project? Well, it, so let's just back up for a moment. Remember okay. under the first section, I'm sorry if yeah. I wasn't clear, it says that the PUC for priority sites, that's what we're talking about the yeah. definition here, shall establish a simplified process. That's for all um, potential projects on a priority site, okay? And now general language about reducing the cost. And then second, establish a registration process for a plant that's on a roof or parking canopy or 15 kilowatts of or less, okay? Okay. We continue with the um, these are the criteria that would be under the definition of the term. The two at the end, I and J, they were not in that prior law that I mentioned earlier, the pilot project law. So these are, are new and different. These would be that on the same parcel or, or adjacent to, um, I'm sorry, on the same parcel as adjacent to or on the same electrical feeder of a customer who's been allocated at least 50% of electrical output or under J, a plant where residential customers receive at least 50% of the system's electrical output. Any residential customers? I'm sorry, what did you say? It, like any, what is, so what is that? A plant where customers. residential customers, is that like <coughs> the peak, like Sorry. directly like the, on the land that it's on, or is that like well, the community? I, I, I'm not. So according to the language here, it would be residential customers, homeowners, or people living in a home are receiving 50% of the system's electrical output in some way. It doesn't, it doesn't give any specifics beyond that. So I may not be understanding your question. Residential customers receiving this. So it doesn't say okay. homeowner, it doesn't say renter, it doesn't yep, yep, differentiate. Yep, yep. We got it. People that are eligible for residential rate. <clears throat> there's people who are directly connected to this system. Well, so it seems to be as, through, as, as well, through, through the grid. Well, here it says receive at least 50% of systems electrical output. So it doesn't say directly connected. 
I'm um, now an I adjacent to or on the same electrical feeder of a customer. Yeah, so that's, 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 that's directly connected, it sounds like. It does. J does not. To me. J does not. Right. So J sounds like it's if it, 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 it feeds it feeds this community so it feeds the grid. To clarify, those are ores, right? I'm sorry, what? To clarify, those are ores, right? Not ants. Yeah, so under this yeah. definition, all you are one of to fall in the definition, you only need to be one of. Thank you. You could be three of, but you only need to be one of. So it's not and they have to do all those things. It's one of those different things. And refresh me, I and J, are they modified by any size constraints, generation constraints? Well, Can they not be any size? Not under the definition of priority site, but that term is only relevant to what's in section one. So priority site is a defined term within that definition. It's not limited. But it's only relevant to what I, the language I went over in section one about uh, the commission developing a simplified process and a registration process. Question. Can you hold on one second? I'm not certain. Yeah, Did I you have a follow up question? One more, which is, um, and maybe this may be a, lar a long answer, or maybe not. Um, what types of projects are not? <coughs> Section. I'm sorry, not what? What types of projects are not permitted in this section? Not permitted. Yeah. Like, well, you have to be fall within one of these categories. Yeah. Um, so gravel pit, brownfield, super fun, whatever it is. You have to fall within one of those. If you fall within none of these, you would could not qualify as a priority site. Right. And so my question is, are there are there projects that would not qualify. It seems like there are a lot of projects that would qualify. I, I, I don't know the answer. Yeah. You need someone who's actually developing these projects. Okay. I don't know okay. the answer to that. Okay. It, it is a long list of different yeah. options. You're right. And, and I'm but, not, this is not yeah. my specialty, so that's yeah. something. So I, I can't tell in you in the field if this includes all or most projects in Vermont or not. I don't know. Um, so going back to J I and J, I think it was. Um, so I'm <clears throat> looking at, at I, and I'm just wondering if, if this is correct, that if I'm a, um, a solar developer, and Mike has a business, mm -hmm. and I build adjacent to his business, and he's allocated 50% mm -hmm. of the output, that's a contract between us, between me and Mike. So. After building it, the next year I can. Our contract's complete, and I can change it. So I'm now selling power to Scott. But I got, but I got. Um, you streamlined. A streamlined process. So, according to the words of the statute, which is what we're going through today, is that possible? Yes. I don't know how long contracts normally are for, yeah. and I don't know if. There would be some process to look back if there was an allegation of bad faith that you benefited from the streamlining process. I don't know. But this is focused on falling within the definition, being able then to avail yourself of the streamlining process or the registration process. Yep. After that, it's not relevant. Right. Unless it's a net metering project, a group net metering project. The, it, the power cannot be sold directly right. to a customer. Yeah, so, yeah. okay. So if it's a, if it's a uh, merchant generator, then then it's it's being sold to utilities either in Vermont or it could be out, out, out of, outside of Vermont. So the only way you could know whether 50% of the customers were residential was if it was a net meter project because you'd know right. which which um, electric customers have, have are participating in it. Any more questions? Sec Not Sorry? yet. Okay. Right. So, oh, oh, you're still going ahead. I, I, I was going to go to Section Four. Do you have a question okay. about Section okay. Three? Um, I have I have a suggestion to think about in terms of the definition of uh, a uh, 
what are we calling now priority site, mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. which is to maybe consider adding to that um, uh, uh, projects that are built on um, uh, and sites where there is a significant unused uh, transmission and inter interconnection capacity, in particular thinking of uh, uh, the, the Vermont Yankee site that we know basically has this huge infrastructure that um, that isn't being used now. So that's a, just some, a suggestion to, to think about just to add um, to this list because by putting projects there, uh, you are not uh, putting pressures or demand on uh, on the system as opposed to potentially you could be if you're putting locating the site somewhere else so but wouldn't this wouldn't that sort of a use be greater than 15 kilowatts would, would that work? wouldn't a uh, use there be greater than 15 kilowatts or, or a, a generation facility there in order to take advantage of that infrastructure it would be greater than 15 kilowatts, wouldn't it? But I've, uh, this is where I guess I'm confused. I thought we we're talking about uh, the priority site is both as for step. larger projects as well as under 15. Well, it wouldn't it, make sense to go put the, you know, right. 10 kilowatt on the Vermont Yankee site. But if someone was putting up a 100 kilowatt site, but it might make sense to encourage them to put it. So can I make a suggestion? Um, let's get through the bill. I had the same <laughs> yeah. issue, and I'd like to circle back okay. yeah. and kind of get to our decision tree on sure. what um, types of sites are actually affected by this. Sure. So section four, um, this is modifying 30 VSA 8010, which concerns net metering. It is inserting new F, and it states, except for net metering systems for which the commission has established a registration process, the commission shall issue a final determination on application filed pursuant to this section within 60 days of its filing, or if the original filing did not substantially comply with the commission's rules within 60 days of the date in which the commission notifies the applicant that the filing is complete. So in other words, if it doesn't substantially comply, they need to fix it, uh, provide new info, whatever it is, within 60 days of that application being complete, uh, they need to have a final determination. Or if the commission determines that the application raises a significant issue within 180 days, then there's similar language that if that application did not substantially comply with one within 180 days, Days of it being complete. So what this does is it has mandatory time limits. The default is 60 days um, for all net metering projects for approval. I do not believe that there's currently statutory time limits. There are time limits in PUC rules that are more narrow under the Public Utility Commission Rule 5.2. 105C um, to get a certificate of public good for a hydro plant, for ground mounted solar up to 15 kilowatts, and for any type of roof mounted solar, unless there's a letter from the inter from the utility about interconnection issues, which is what we talked about earlier, that uh, the CPG would be deemed granted. Uh, 11 days after filing if the project is less than 15 kilowatts or if it's more than 15 kilowatts 31 days after filing that's pursuant to puc rule they put the time limits in their own rules but that is only for that small universe of projects these are different time limits for a larger universe of projects it would be for all net metering projects except for those that are in the registration process so it's a bigger universe of projects. So, so I just want to be clear on bigger. Um, am I correct in saying that what you're saying is this relates to bigger projects? A, a bigger... Um, because a bigger universe, there's far more small projects that are deemed... I meant... Um, the universe of bigger projects. As as they bigger. could be bigger projects in the kilowatts. That's not what I meant. I meant, it, I meant all net metering projects would be subject to these time limits. Whereas in the rules, what I read to you was more limited. It was uh, ground-mounted solar up to 15 kilowatts or roof-mounted. 
So it's more limited. That's what I meant by limited universe. Not to kill a one level. Is that clear? Well, I, so I'm going to play it back to you. Um, there are literally, I believe, thousands of applications that go to or went to the PUC last year. And a vast majority of those were for small solar projects. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I heard you say is that for those small projects, they are deemed to be approved uh, unless the utility raises an issue. Well, for ground mounted solar up to 15 kilowatts, and for roof. yes, within 11 days, uh, any roof mounted solar, yes. So, so yeah. yes, for those types of projects, there are time limits. Yeah, and, and I don't know the statistics, although we have them. That, that, that you know, for the for the many, many, many um, applications that go to PUC, mm -hmm. what you just described is a big percentage of those projects, which is the homeowner yep. who was putting solar. Right. And so now here in section four, we're dealing with something else. Correct. Um, but under this language, it covers all net metering projects unless there's a registration pro process, which are the smaller projects. That's standard 15 kilowatt. Mm -hmm. And then for all other projects, there are these time limits in place, not based on the size of the project or the kilowatts, but based on the complexity in essence of the application. You see under two, there's 180 days for a significant issue, which is not a defined term. So. Two questions, Luke. Sure. Um, in one, I'm looking for definitions. In one, substantially comply. Mm -hmm. Right. And then in, I think it's in two, significant issues. Right. Per issue. So within this bill, there's no definition of either term. Substantially comply is often used in statute or rule. I don't know if the PUC has a definition, but I think even if they did try to define it, it would sort of be common sense, which means different things to different people. I don't know, not, not really. Substantially comply to me as a lawyer is a term I can wrap my head around pretty okay. easily. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now maybe the PUC has other language to find it. I don't know. But I, I think it's, as a lawyer, that, that does not strike me as difficult to understand. Significant issue, I'm not aware if they define it or not. That, uh, I'm not aware if they define it, and that would be a good question. But that needs to be defined. What substantially comply mean to you? It would be, well, this is a, an application, so there's a form. Yeah. Whether it's paper or online or whatever. Yeah. You are putting down certain information. So to me, if I was looking at it as an attorney, yeah. not an expert in this area, and not someone who's working for the PUC, did you fill out the form? Did you put all the information? Do we have all the information to make a decision on this? Have you checked all the boxes? Do we know everything we need to know? That's to me. Okay. And for many projects, I think the assumption is if you provide full and accurate information, that sounds like pretty, pretty easy. Uh, substantially, yeah. to me, when I think of substantially, mm -hmm. it means not quite all the way. You're slicing that onion pretty fine. All right. But I think what you're saying is similar that's, to what I'm saying. Okay. Whether you think substantial or not, we're getting to a similar point. Okay. Well, that's my, that's my point. Too. This <laughs> may be a question more for the committee than Luke, but didn't we just pass a registration and fee structure for solar projects, 500 KW, uh, $100 fee for yeah. 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 So is it, that be, isn't that similar to? It did not include language that, um, uh, so when I presented our committee's recommendation to the Ways and Means Committee, I also talked to, I don't have the language in front of you, but our interest, if there's going to be a fee associated with this, which there is, um, that the PUC increases productivity in working on these. Um, that, that is not in the people. That is not in the people. Okay. So that was not addressed in, 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 the, in the bill that we passed last week, the week before it. Right. Okay. Uh, 
So I wanted to address Laura's question about uh, what substantially uh, comply. Uh, in the application process for uh, projects, uh, sometimes they are required to get A&R approval uh, to do a site review, see if there are any wetlands there, um, the boundary, the bo wetland boundaries. Um, they, they're required to have a site plan, and there are other requirements too. And so all those, ha all those requirements for that size project have to be completed before that 60-day uh, time frame kicks in. So if I submit an application and it's not complete, that clock doesn't go off yet. That clock doesn't start. I have to complete the application, fulfill all the requirements of, of the application before that clock starts. Why wouldn't we say if it's not complete, that if the original filing is not complete, as opposed to substantially comply? Substantially comply. Sorry, I mean, sorry to be kind of picky uni about this, but. It says well, um, within 60 days of the date on which the commission notifies the applicant that the filing is complete. That's if you starts. did not substantially comply. No, so there's in, something. That's in one. Without right, 60 days of its filing. Or, or if the original filing, filing did, did not substantially comply, comply within, 60 within 60 days. 60 days of the date on which the commission oh. notifies if the you're that's complete. So that's when the clock starts. Uh, I think you're misreading it. You so yeah. wherever you say substantially comply, comply or complete, whatever word you use, yeah. you filled out the application correctly. You put down all the info, you've checked all the boxes. Yeah. You file it. Yeah. 60 days, have to approve. Yeah. If there's something missing, I'm trying to use different words. Yes. Lacking, they go back and say, hey, we need this other info. After you submit it, then the 60 day clock starts ticking. My, my point is, I, I, without it being defined, it feels like substantially complies could be open to some interpretation. I mean, why not use clearer words like complete? Or complete, yeah. Well, do you believe that makes it clear? It could certainly change. Yeah, it it, it's, it's, it's well. me that the difference is, is, is between whether there is a matter of substance missing in the application mm -hmm. as opposed to just some I that's not dotted or something like that. And so, do you think all people would agree about what a matter of substance is that might be uh, I mean, Or do you I, think I, there might be some I, 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 I kind of trust Luke's uh, take on it, but, but, I, but a reasonable person. Yeah. You should never, you should never, should never trust the lawyer. Uh, what you should do, I mean, this is a walkthrough of a bill that was proposed by a sponsor, and you guys decide to take it up or not and modify it. If you are, I would have the PUC come in and talk about these terms. They're valid questions, but get their input on what those terms may mean, or if there's a better one, which it may well be. So, just not create a problem. Yeah, understood.